Welcome, everybody. This is, uh, we are here gathered as a Provo Municipal Council for a, a meeting this evening. It's 5.32 p.m. on Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. Uh, this meeting will be conducted entirely via electronic means on August 10th, 2020, in accordance with Utah Code 52-4-2074. The council chair, George Handley, determined that conducting meetings of the municipal council with an anchor location, such as the municipal council chamber, represents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present there. Uh, there are, these are the facts upon which Mr. Handley has made this determination. Utah has been in a declared state of emergency due to COVID-19 since tw March 6, 2020, a disease outbreak which the World Health Organization has characterized as a pandemic. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention state that COVID-19 is easily spread from person to person between people who are in close contact with one another. The disease spreads through respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs sneezes or talks, and it may be spread by people who are asymptomatic. Federal, state, and local authorities have recommended that individuals limit public gatherings, wear face masks, and follow social distancing guidelines. Notwithstanding that Utah generally and Utah County specifically have been moved to the low-risk yellow phase, reported COVID-19 cases in Provo continue to rise at a high rate, more than 100 cases per day on a 14-day average. Physical distancing measures will be difficult to set up and maintain in the Provo City Municipal Council Chamber. Additionally, the chair of the governing board of the redevelopment agency of Provo City has determined that its meetings are subject to the same risks and has adopted the same procedure as the Municipal Council. This meeting will be available to the public for live broadcast and on-demand viewing at youtube.com slash Provo City Council. The council requests that attendees help maintain the decorum of the meeting by silencing electronic devices and being respectful to others and by waiting to speak until called upon by the council chair. In the current situation, uh, as this meeting is being held via Zoom webinar and broadcast over YouTube, I remind you to turn off your mics when not speaking so as to minimize the potential for background noises and conversations to be picked up, recorded and broadcast for all to hear. Uh, I am this evening joined uh, by my fellow uh, city council members. I am George Handley, the chair. I'm joined by Dave Harding, our vice chair, Dave Shipley, Shannon Ellsworth, Dave Sewell, Bill Fillmore, and Travis Hoban. We're also joined by uh, Mr. Cliff Strachan, our executive director, our chief administrative officer, Wayne Parker, and Assistant Administrative Officer Dixon Holmes, and I understand the mayor will be joining us shortly. And we're also joined by our council attorney, Brian Jones, and other staff members who are assisting us. Um, we will begin by uh, having an opening prayer that will be offered by Shannon Ellsworth, and then we'll have a Pledge of Allegiance uh, performed by Cliff Strachan. Our dear kind Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity to meet together as a city council. We are grateful for the many people who help us in this capacity, all of our staff and all the citizens who care and who participate in these processes. We're grateful for this wonderful city and this wonderful state and the amazing nation that we live in. And we're grateful for the freedoms and liberties that we enjoy and the responsibilities that we carry as citizens. Father in heaven, please help us to make the best possible decisions for Provo City, for all the people who live here and who visit here, and help us to be wise and kind in all that we do. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Ellsworth and uh, Mr. Strachan. We will uh, begin, Mr. Strachan, with a uh, preamble, if you want to go ahead. <clears throat> so there are usually three types of meet items for which public com comment will be received. Tonight, because it's a special meeting and we're dealing with one item, 
um, there will only be the third item, third type that we'll use. And that is for items on the agenda that do not require a public hearing. The council will allow up to 15 minutes for comments on each item when the, when the chair calls for those comments. Because the city council is meeting virtually using Zoom webinar, and this meeting is being broadcast on Provo City Council's YouTube channel, we have enabled telephone access to receive public comment, the numbers for which are shown on the screen during the meeting. Callers may have to try multiple numbers to get connected. When a caller is connected, they will be required to enter the meeting ID and enter the pound symbol. When asked for a personal ID number, enter pound. The caller will now enter the meeting as an attendee and will be able to hear the meeting while muted. If a caller wishes to speak on the item being discussed, they can press star nine to indicate their desire to comment and then wait to be called upon. Callers will be called upon by the last four digits of the listed telephone number. Please provide your name and city of residence before you make your comments. Each caller will be given up to two minutes to speak. A timer will be posted on screen and a beep should be audible to the caller when their time is up. A reminder that there is a lag of almost 60 seconds between the meeting and the broadcast. So to avoid confusion, Callers should mute YouTube or Facebook broadcast while they're on the phone so that they can hear the, the discussion in real time over the phone. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Strack. And so um, we will begin with, uh, well, okay, actually, I'm going to just ask your quick advice here, Mr. Strack, and because uh, uh, I know we were talking about this earlier. Do we want to allow for the 15 minutes of public comment now, or should we do that after the presentation? Um, I think in, in the normal course of events, although it's not required, the council customarily allows public comment on the topic item uh, after it's been presented and questions have been asked and before the council actually deliberates the implied motion. Okay, that's what we'll do. So we'll turn the time over and we uh, welcome Mayor Kafusi for joining us. Um, we will turn the time then to Mr. Jones, who appears to be upside down visually there. I don't know <laughs> what happened, but you're, uh, you're visually upside down, Mr. Jones. That is exciting. Um... <laughs> And I do not know how to fix that. Let's see. It's in your settings for your, on the start video, when you go to like choose virtual background, I believe there's a way to turn yourself right side up from there. There's a box checked that would have done that. Well, let's see if I, if I click stop video and then share my screen, is that still going to work anyway? Because you don't really need to see me. Oh, but it, I don't have screen sharing. Okay, cable. try, I just fixed the settings, Brian. Try sharing your screen now. Okay. Let's see. Okay, is the ordinance up on everyone's screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is the ordinance. This is uh, what's been labeled as version five uh, as sent out uh, earlier today. Uh, as the council is aware and, and staff, there was a draft that had been uh, drafted as early as last uh, Wednesday or Thursday. That draft was, uh, as explained in the previous emails and discussion, essentially an amalgamation of the Salt Lake County and Summit and Grand County mandates that were already in existence. It's important to recognize uh, in saying that, that all, all of those mandates were actually executive actions rather than legislative actions. So there was some, some adaptation of those that needed to take place in order to turn this into legislation rather than just an executive order. And so uh, that was done last week. There was a quite, amount of, quite a bit of discussion about what should go into the ordinance. Um, last Thursday night during the special meeting that was held at that time. Um, there were some things that were not decided at that point, and so there was a survey sent out to council members uh, or a, a poll or what, whatever you'd like to call it, a list of questions uh, sent out Monday morning with, uh, to try to clarify what, um, what issues and principles and specific details uh, were desired in the ordinance as a, 
by the council as a whole. Uh, so um, that yesterday afternoon, there was an ordinance drafted based on that survey. There's been quite a bit of discussion and some, and some changes requested. As the council members are aware, um, during the day today, changes were only made when they seemed to be supported by a majority of the council. Uh, so following the presentation and the public comment, uh, what I would recommend is that if there are any further changes beyond what you see here that are desired by individual council members, that a motion should be made to amend this draft to make those changes and then discussion take place uh, and a vote on that motion to see if, if uh, the collective will of the council is to actually make any given specific change. So with that um, introduction, uh, Unless there, is some, unless there is some discussion that the council wants to have about it, I will largely skip over the preamble, which about 90% of it is, is directly out of the preamble of the resolution that was just uh, passed last Thursday night. Really the only difference is there were some changes made to this paragraph here about um, uh, where this last sentence was uh, edited to just list some of the greater restrictions that could be imposed if the transmission is not slowed. And then this paragraph at the top of the next page from lines 43 to 46 was added uh, and is new, which just mentions the fact that a resolution was passed last week and, and references that resolution. So with that context, I'll scroll down and I'll, I'll get into the meat of the ordinance. Um, just in order to do it, uh, chronologically, I suppose, I don't know if that's the right word, but to, to, to go through it in the order that it appears, let me make some prefatory comments about chapter 9.17. So part one of the proposed ordinance makes edits to the already existing chapter 9.17 uh, of Provo City Code, which is the chapter that deals with civil infractions. For the most part, the currently existing list of civil infractions is a list of parking um, violations. There are also some things like skateboarding in places where city code says that you can't and a handful of other things like that. Because of the request and the, and the discussion from the council members about having any mask mandate uh, or mask ordinance, face covering ordinance, not invoke criminal penalties, um, what was proposed was to add uh, any face covering requirements to this list of civil infractions. So there's quite a bit of text here, but only where you see blue is, the, is there a change to what's already there. So 9.17030 is the list of things that are civil infractions. You'll see parking regulations, uh, handicap um, uh, things, motor vehicle license plates. And so then down at line 80, have added violation of Provo City Code Chapter 9.25, which is the face covering ordinance. Then there's a section later in 9.17 that determines what the fees should be. And you'll see here that I've added at line 135 that violations of the face covering ordinance uh, have, will have fees that are set by the table included in the same section. And then that table appears beginning at line 138 and it says that violations of the face covering ordinance of a specific subsection of the face covering uh, ordinance, which is the specific subsection that we will talk about later that deals only with organizers of large gatherings that violate the specific responsibilities they have, that is subject to a civil infraction fine of $500. Then you'll notice that the very next line says all other regulations listed which would include any other violation of the face covering ordinance has a maximum fine of $55. And let's see. So then part two of the ordinance enacts the new chapter point, chapter 9.25. And let me really briefly, it seems like we're having a little, from, from the chat messages that I see popping up, it appears that there's, a few that are having problems seeing this. So let me just send it out really quickly to the council and 
so I just sent that email. So hopefully anyone who is having trouble seeing it can open their own version. Um, so, he, so beginning at line 147, we have the, ch the new chapter 9.25 that's been proposed. Uh, section 010 describes the purpose of the, of the chapter, which is to require all individuals living within or visiting Provo City to wear face coverings while in indoor or outdoor hour areas accessible to the public, including businesses and city buildings, or who are in attendance at large gatherings. Now, again, that, that doesn't create the requirement. That just states the purpose of the chapter. Section 020 uh, requires specifically that any individual within Provo shall wear a face covering that completely covers the nose and mouth when in indoor or outdoor areas accessible to the public where consistent social distancing of at least six feet is not possible, reasonable, or prudent. So based on this section alone, whether you are indoors or outdoors, you would need to wear a face covering if social distancing is not possible. But if social distancing is possible, either or indoors or outdoors, you would not be required to wear a face covering. Section 030 provides special requirements for large public gatherings. And subsection one says that any individual in attendance at an indoor public gathering of more than 50 individuals must wear a face covering regardless of whether or not social distancing is, is possible. So this trumps the previous uh, section and provides a special requirement for gatherings larger than 50 people. Subsection two makes it unlawful to organize such a gathering without requiring the attendees to wear face coverings and to um, provide clear notice at the entrance uh, to, to the gathering of, the of those requirements, of the requirement to wear face coverings. Section 040 is a list of exemptions. Um, it exempts currently uh, individuals that are under five, individuals with a medical or mental health condition, individuals involved in communication with uh, a hearing impaired person, um, individuals covered by uh, local, state, or fe federal safety regulations that would prohibit the face covering, uh, individuals receiving a service to the nose or face, individuals seated at a restaurant while they're eating or drinking, individuals while purchasing a product or receiving a serv service if, if identification is necessary, and individuals engaged in uh, strenuous physical activity where circumstances are not reasonably conducive to wearing a face covering. Um, Section 050 includes the requirements uh, to post certain things. Uh, subsection 1 provides that all businesses must uh, post a notice in a clearly visible location at or near the entrance that declares face coverings are required by law. Subsection 2 is, in, is intended to require that the city must provide that notice to them. There's been quite a bit of discussion today about potentially removing that subsection. And uh, just to throw out there for clarity's sake, the idea that's been thrown around of council staff generating a digital version of a notice and having that available to be sent to businesses for them to print, um, if that were the direction that the council ultimately chose to go, the only change that would need to happen to the ordinance would be subsection two could just be deleted and subsection three would be renumbered and that would be the only change necessary. And subsection three is really a, a reminder, um, but it specifically states that as we already covered up in 030 subsection two, that there are special notice requirements for organizers of, public, of large public gatherings. Uh, subsection three down here at line 207 just reminds them of that so that you see that requirement in either place. Uh, subsection 060, uh, is a, alludes back to what, where I started by saying that the, viola the violations are a civil infraction and are subject to the penalties in chapter 9.17, which is the fee that we've already discussed. And then if, you, if we go down to part three, A through D is standard ordinance language that we, we put in all of our ordinances just about the effective date, et cetera. Uh, subsection E is new and is a requirement uh, that the council in their first regularly scheduled meeting in October, uh, review the provisions of this ordinance in order to make it determine whether, whether it should be repealed, amended, or left in place. 
And uh, I added a clarifying sentence that says nothing in that statement prevents you from making changes before then if for some reason the council desires to do so. And that is, that's the ordinance. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Any questions for Mr. Jones? Uh, uh, Mr. Harding, go ahead. Uh, just based on some of the public feedback I've been getting, um, I just want to make, uh, I guess, ask a question, make, make, it, make sure it's very clear. Um, is there anything in this ordinance that uh, we have before us that would ban mass gatherings? No. Uh, the, um, the only thing that would prevent someone from, uh, having, from holding a mass gathering would be uh, if they failed to wear masks at the gathering or the organizer failed to uh, enforce that requirement or failed to provide notice that they needed to have uh, masks. But there's nothing that... So any individual shall be required to wear a face covering when indoor or outdoor areas accessible to the public where consistent social distancing of at least six feet is not possible, reasonable, or prudent. So I'm at the park with my friends that I um, maybe live close by or, or whatever it might be. So I am required then to, if I'm at a barbecue at a park, wear a face mask if I'm not standing six feet apart from that person, is that correct? Also, this doesn't clarify family units. <clears throat> so this would say, this would, would say that even my wife would need to be six feet from me or, or I would have to wear a mask. Is that correct? Um, on its face, yes. I, the, um, let's see, more consistent. Yes. There, there is not. Okay. Current, there is not currently in the ordinance an except if you are in an indoor or outdoor area accessible to the public, there's not currently in the ordinance any kind of exemption for family groupings. Okay, so that would be a major concern for me um, <clears throat> that on its face, whether the intent is to enforce that or not, um, we are not allowing for family groupings. Also, um, I, I also have a concern with the fact that I can't be there with some friends uh, and, and that if I am at the park with some friends, if I'm outdoors even, um, I have to be six feet apart as well. So I just want to ex express that concern and maybe we should consider a change on that, but we can address that. I just wanted to <clears throat> bring that up as, as one thing that I, I thought maybe I misunderstood, but it sounds like I didn't. Thank you. Mr. Jones, I have a question. Um, I, 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 I do want to come back to Mr. Hoban's uh, question after my question, if that's okay. But uh, large public gatherings, um, if, if a retail store, say at uh, Provo Town Center or Riverwoods, wants to have a special event, uh, I mean, I guess the question is in larger stores, um, there are going to be more than 50 people in the store. As long as people are social distancing reasonably, uh, there's not going to be an issue. But if they're uh, hosting a special event, um, I guess I'm just asking for a little bit of clarification about large public gatherings, if it's associated with a business as opposed to with um, a private party that's happening. The Ordinance is silent about that. So it's all about the interpretation of what a public gathering is. Um, in my own you know, personal thought, uh, I would interpret a public gathering to be where um, that, that group of people were intentionally brought together for, for whatever purpose they're together. I, I wouldn't think that shoppers in a store would constitute a public gathering regardless of number, um, but that's an, that's a question of interpretation that's not defined in the ordinance. Yeah, I think I think I would just, uh, re I don't know if it'll end up needing clearer language, but I think it's clear that the spirit of it would not be intended to put undue burdens on businesses. Uh, going back to Mr. Hoban's question, um, I, I don't know if there's some language in there that could be uh, placed there, but uh, with regard to unrelated people, um, 
uh, health guidelines already stipulate, I mean, they're not uh, ordinances, obviously, but the health guidelines already stipulate that we should not be within less than six feet of people who, with whom we don't live, even if they're close friends. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's actually been um, my understanding since March. And I think I've seen lots of people um, practicing that socially with other people. And I, I, I do think there is a risk if we don't uh, send that signal that that is uh, misunderstood, right? And you could end up with a, a gathering that's um, much, much more at risk if, if we don't. Um, Ms. Ellsworth, go ahead. Um, yeah, I have a question about the sign, uh, the sign sub subsection. What have other communities or counties done on signs? Have they provided one from the county or from the city, or did they just leave it up to the business? I don't know that I know the answer to that. Um, I can. Um, let me try to open up my spreadsheet from um, earlier and see, let's see, if I can see to the degree that I noted anything about that, uh, it would be in my spreadsheet. Um, Let's see, Springdale, I didn't make any notes about whether there, about posting requirements. Um, Logan, I didn't make any notes about that. Uh, Bluff, the town of Bluff required owners of public indoor spaces to post signage. Uh, I don't have any information about where they got that signage, but it was required. Grand County required businesses to post notices. Salt Lake County, um, I don't think Salt Lake County did, but I didn't affirmatively note that in my uh, summary. And Summit County required businesses to post notices. I have heard anecdotally, but again, again remember that my, my previous uh, study of this issue that I uh, presented at the last meeting was based on the text of the actual mandates themselves. Um, so, so I think most of your question uh, probably wouldn't be included there. I would point out, I would kind of refer back to my comment I made earlier, which is that um, all of those other actions were executive in nature rather than legislative in nature. So it certainly could be that some of those uh, institutions, counties or, or towns may have uh, the administration or the executive branch may ha have decided to uh, provide some signage, and I've heard anecdotally that that may have been the case, but I don't have any specific information about that. Okay. Well, I would be comfortable if we um, if we removed the part that said Provo City would uh, create, produce, or provide businesses with any kind of signage. Um, when I was at the Target today in Provo, they already had a sign outside that said, by executive action, masks are required in this store. Uh, even though that's not the case, that was the sign that they were using. And and then when I was in the store on the intercom, they you know they had this kind of PSA interruption where they said um, by local uh, by local action, masks must be worn in the store. So I just wouldn't want to interrupt something that a, a large chain store already has established and ask them to come to Provo City and, and get the new one, if that's appropriate. Mr. Hoban. Uh, we can't hear you, Mr. Hoban. Oh, thanks. Um, thank you for clarifying that if I'm, you know, at the park or something like that with a neighbor or that I have to, even if I'm outdoors, I have to be six feet apart or wearing a mask. And if I don't, I'm subject to the $500 fine. Um, no, not the $500 I, fine. I, the, the, okay. the, 50, the $500 fine only applies to organizers of large public, of public oh, gatherings perfect. larger than 50 okay. um, that don't comply with the requirements to enforce the mandate or to post signage. Everybody else is subject only to a $55 fine. 
Great. Thank you for clarifying. I didn't see that in the latest version. Thank you. Um, but still, I'm in, I'm uh, in violation of the ordinance. Um, I wanted to respond to that, but probably this isn't the time for discussion, right? This is more so the time for asking questions and clarifying and such. Yeah, cu customarily we've used this time to ask questions to make sure that if there's anything that needs clarification, it's clarified now before the public begins comment. Uh, and then following public comment is, the, is what we've customarily used for debate of, of the actual uh, text and principles. And just Thank for... You. I'm uh, I'm trying to track what what are the issues that we will want to return to uh, for possible motions or changes, and I've got written down uh, family units and uh, signs. Uh, Mr. Sewell, comprehensive view of family units would be those living in the same household. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Hoven brought up an important oversight. Most of the guidelines that I can remember reading don't suggest that you wear masks or socially distance between those who are living in the same household. So I think that needs to be addressed. Okay, Mr. Harding. Um, you know, we're... All of this is so new, and I think we're just kind of feeling our way through it, but um, just the use of the term social distancing, um, and I think, when it, yeah, so that, that's included in our ordinance as well. Um, you know, I don't know how well defined that is, but I would, so I would venture that um, most people's definition of social distancing takes into account those guidelines that, that would not include um, households. And, you know, we're not just saying physical distance, but we're talking about the social distancing, which, which I think includes, um, you know, households um, as, as part of that definition. Um, and I, I do know that we've we talked about social distancing of at least six feet. Um, I've, been, I've been pondering um, about how I think indoors, particularly indoors without good ventilation, social distancing might be quite a bit more than outdoors. Um, you know, perhaps at, at the park, you know, four feet or anyway. It, so, so um, anyway, that was just something I've been thinking about is, is what exactly is social distancing? And so it, perhaps it is already in this ordinance uh, since we use the term social distancing. All right, Mr. Strachan has a couple of questions. Brian, the question came up a lot in the Open City Hall comments and in the emails. Can you talk about the legality of this ordinance and, and how it stands up to the arguments about uh, constitutionality? Um, sure, I don't know that I've uh, necessarily seen all of those arguments, but uh, it's been as I, I think is evident from um, watching this issue across the nation, there are a large number of face covering mandates already in place. Uh, some of those have been challenged, those have already been upheld. Um, uh, the Provo City Council as a legislative and local uh, subdivision of the state of Utah is granted broad police powers by the state, which includes a mandate to pass any ordinance or, or regulation necessary for the health, safety, and welfare of the, of the citizens. Um, that mandate includes uh, providing any kind of laws or regulations that are, that are health-related and could involve things like uh, if they if these weren't already in place, things like requiring seat belts in uh, to be worn or um, uh, airbags to be installed or uh, safety inspections on cars to happen uh, on an annual basis before registrations are renewed, or, and and this is well uh, perhaps more personal and I think in the view of many more inconvenient than some of those other regulations, it is still nevertheless a health and safety regulation and I, I don't see any reason to doubt its legality. Okay. 
Is that it, Mr. Strachan? Yes. All right. Uh, seeing no further questions then, uh, there is a hand up from the public. We'll go to public comment and I want to, oh, sorry, Mr. Strachan. We were going to give you an overview of the Open City Hall results and some statistics. Yes, please do that. Okay. First, and then we'll, and I just, uh, I, I think just to clarify again, you've said this before, but we're, we have received over, as you'll see here shortly, the public will see here shortly, over 4,000 comments in Open City Hall uh, which is not an official scientific survey, but it is a method for gathering public input in the same way that we gather it in public comment periods in city council meetings. And in the same way we receive emails and phone calls and texts from people. Um, so because we've received an extraordinary amount of public comment already, uh, we're going to limit our public comment period to 15 minutes, and then we're gonna return it to uh, council discussion. So go ahead, Mr. Strachan. Okay. As requested, um, we had reopened this Open City Hall um, webpage for more comments, where we had heard from nearly 2,700 people online and, and had received well over 100 emails uh, as of last Thursday. We've now had nearly 4,400 responses on Open City Hall and about 200 emails. If all comments were two minutes long, we'd have received nearly 150 hours of public comment. Um, and I just want to make clear that the council and the staff are grateful for all who reached out to share their opinions. Of those who took the survey, 78% live in Provo, 50% work in Provo, and 72% do some or all of their shopping in Provo. 68% said they always or almost always wear a mask. 18% said only if it's required, and 11% do not wear one. <clears throat> now, what we learned from the Open City Hall and from the emails is that there are many opponents and we've heard from many hundreds of them to this or any other kind of mask mandate from the city. If I may generalize for you, the most common objections are infringement of freedoms, that any such infringements are against the Constitution, that masks are uncomfortable, unhealthy, that they are an imposition for people with certain medical, mental health and physical limitations, uh, opponents take issue with the statistics, many citing that a survival rate of 99.96% means we should not need to curtail our activities. They disagree with the science, the government, the media, and public health officials, and rightfully note that some of the advice has changed since COVID-19 struck. They also call for personal responsibility for how each individual chooses to care for their health and some equate a mask mandate with the lockdown from the state earlier this year that caused businesses to shut down and jobs to be lost. Additional objections to a mask mandate concern enforcement issues, the city's ability to enforce, whether it's the proper role of government and whether, and some have expressed concern about how far a mandate could or should go. On the other side of the issue, there were many more proponents who by their comments state that a public health emergency means extraordinary measures are needed and that while we don't want to wear a mask, uh, they will because they consider it a personal responsibility to protect others. And in return, they deserve the same consideration. Uh, some are concerned about the lack of masks, uh, masks in many environments they go into. They're concerned about large gatherings. Sorry, I'm scrolling up here on my notes. Um, Many have expressed they'd hate to be responsible for unknowingly or even worse, carelessly transmitting the virus to others. They see wearing masks as the way to keep businesses open, to keep working. Proponents believe the statistics, the government and public health officials on these matters. Some want a strong mandate, others want a more targeted approach. They are concerned about immediate and long-term effects of COVID-19, not just the deaths. It is noteworthy that some opponents say they won't shop where masks are required, and some proponents say they won't shop where masks aren't required. Um, our stats show that 60% are more likely and 24% less likely to patronize a business with a mask mandate. Let me give you some more statistics uh, from our data. More people believe wearing a mask protects others, 75% of them, than believe it protects the wearers while 18% believes a mask offers no protection from exposure to the virus and 20% believe the mask is harmful to the wearer. 66% uh, 
support or strongly support a mask mandate, while 32% oppose or strongly oppose. Out of those indicating that they live in Provo, 73% support and 25% oppose a mandate. 63% indicated it was an appropriate use of government power with 33% indicating it was an overreach. 72% agreed that they have a responsibility to wear a mask in public while 26% disagreed. Um, it's noteworthy that um, one of the, some of the comments that I've seen, seen on social media outside our own poll uh, are from people, uh, students at different levels who are concerned that if an, a major outbreak happens that they could lose their school year just as uh, students lost their school year last year or had to move it to an online and, and uh, that seems to be a, a common phrase, uh, refrain I'm seeing on Facebook. Um, let me just show you some data. <clears throat> this is from the Department of Environmental Quality and they are checking sewage plants for detecting uh, um, COVID, I don't know if it's COVID antibodies, but it's something from the COVID that they are tracking. And this is Provo. Provo indicates that they have an increasing trend of cases. And I think that'll be consistent with what we're seeing in the case counts. This is um, a crude case rate per 100,000 people in Utah by small area. Um, the, high, the darker the color, the higher the rate. Um, on Thursday, we gave you some data that showed that West Provo had a case rate that's about triple what the state's rate is. So it's clear that we're having challenges here with COVID. We have clusters where it's affecting. This would be North Orem. This would be Provo, this would be East Provo, and this appears to be uh, a lot of the wilderness area, but it also includes stuff up on the north side of BYU. Um, anecdotally, um, there are news reports coming out of different places uh, today showing that new uh, cases at university campuses are on the rise as, as people uh, get back together and start mingling. And these are the reasons why the council uh, has been concerned. This last one is from Utah County. Utah County puts out some data, but doesn't seem to give a lot of in information about you know, what is their threshold for ordering closures or ordering mask mandates. Um, the governor himself had stopped short of a mask mandate, but permitted local governments to impose one given local conditions. Restrictions on public gatherings and required social distancing and masks have been required by Provo School District, Alpine School District, UVU and BYU. Um, I think that's an important factor that, that the council is considering in the deliberations I've, I've heard from them um, in, in the case of recognizing that they recognize that there could be a problem and they want to prevent it. And some of the conversations that have been held between different officials has been, the, the message is uh, the more consistent we have the um, protections for our residents, the better off we'll all be. Intermountain Healthcare supports the use of masks in public places along with a host of other ways to protect people from transmission of the disease. I went to their website today and they had a lot of good information about why to wear a mask, how to wear a mask, and things you should be paying attention to. Um, I recommend the site for people who are interested. Um, unsolicited, on Thursday, Dr. Larry Ford who described himself as the sole infectious diseases physician working in Utah County, works at Utah Valley Hospital, sees the impact of COVID-19 every day these days and has called on the city's, uh, called on the city, or let me rephrase that, stated on the city's forum that, quote, it is imperative that we as a community step up to protect ourselves and protect others by wearing a mask whenever we are out of the home and in contact with others, especially when we cannot be socially distanced in an indoor setting where the risk is tra of transmission is lower. We can greatly limit transmission of this virus with, co with the combination of social distancing and mask wearing in public spaces. If we do these two things, we can bring the case numbers down and allow our community to safely open schools and businesses and the economy in general. Masks in particular are key to a return to normalcy. Wearing a mask, he continues, Wearing a mask will reduce the risk of transmitting the SARS-CoV-2 uh, 
uh, basically the COVID um, uh, disease to other people, which is particularly important because to 40 per, uh, some 40 percent of infections are asymptomatic. So we could be spreading the virus unknowingly and mask wearing also reduces the risk of acquiring the virus from other people who could be spreading it with or without symptoms. And wearing a mask poses zero harm to the wearer. There is no harm to the wearer of a cloth face mask, I repeat to be clear, he says. Masks are in an inconvenience, yes, but their use is warranted in the settling of a pandemic that is spreading in our community. A mask mandate would not be overreach, but instead the proper use of government to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. A mask mandate would be a key part of reducing the key, the risk of viral transmission in the community and how we can beat this virus, end of his quote. Um, that is the summary of, of the information that we had and I'm open to questions. Any questions for Mr. Strachan before we open it up for public comment? Thank you, Mr. Strachan, very, very helpful. And we're very appreciative of the incredible labor of our staff uh, that we asked them to do heavy lifting uh, over uh, uh, such an intense period of time, um, especially in preparation for last week's meeting and then again in preparation for tonight. So thank you to all. We'll go to the public comment period. Uh, I see a, a call from caller 9078, uh, go ahead. A little bit of a lag, I think, when you're going to be able to speak. I can't seem to unmute. Um, George, if the caller, uh, once you've given them permission to speak, they just have to press star six. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Oh, good. Okay. I, I had it unmuted. Hey, my name's Kevin McCloskey, and I am the managing partner of a new hockey team in Provo, the Provo Riverblades. And I'd like to thank Mayor Kafusi and her staff for uh, allowing me to call in this evening. Um, the mayor's office has been very instrumental in bringing this team into uh, a city owned facility at Peaks Ice Arena. And uh, you know, we will have, uh, when we dropped the puck for opening night on October 3rd, invested $200,000 into this venture in the city of Provo. We support the city of Provo. And um, you know, we're very concerned that, um, you know, the mask aside, but we feel that people should be able to make their own decisions. We're very concerned about the number of people that they might restrict into the building. It would literally put me out of business before we get going. Um, uh, and I just feel that, you know, uh, we have to have the common sense of the citizens. I was just listening to the comments that uh, uh, the gentleman was reading there. And at some point in time, we're all adults here and we need to act accordingly. And if you're sick, you don't go out. And if you have symptoms, you don't go out. But, uh, you know, there's been as many as 45 million cases a year in the flu in the United States. And I, I get the vaccine thing. They guess on that. There's been 5.9 million COVID. I think the, the fear factor that is promoted by the media has got us completely out of our minds. And I, I just wish there would be some common sense. And I really applaud the mayor and her staff to this point in time of resisting the fact that, uh, you know, it needs to be, we need to be open for business. Um, we certainly think hockey is, is, a, is a great venture in the city of Provo. We like hockey, obviously. Um, but we think schools should be open. We think people should be able to live their lives. And, uh, and let's have some common sense. There's been 43 deaths in, in the city, in, the, in Utah County, out of 635 or 40,000 residents. The, the number is minuscule. I understand that all, all lives matter, and, but there's many deaths many other ways, and we don't ever hear about it, whether it's auto accidents or, you know, or diabetes. So we feel as a business owner, we're the largest tenant of the city in Peaks Ice Arena. And uh, in terms of dollars and ice rented, we are very much in favor of allowing the public to choose um, their own way. And we're very much in favor of being open for business. And, and the, to this point in time, the mayor has been fantastic to allow us to sell tickets for our games. And sure. um, that's my comment. Could you please uh, say your state of, uh, city of residence? So I live up in, um, in Salt Lake City. 
and my business is in Provo. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for the. Uh, sorry, I think you got cut off there. Um, other other comments from the public. Wait, just a, another, yes, go ahead. Uh, caller uh, ending in 7092, go ahead. Push star six and you'll be- Yeah, I just did. Okay. And thanks for letting me know. So Aaron Davidson, uh, American Fork, I work in, in Provo. I shop in Provo and my daughter is moving to Provo to BYU on Saturday. Um, you know, there's just way too much I disagree with on that. Uh, Shannon Ellsworth prayed that you guys would maintain our liberties and freedoms. Um, but here you're talking about removing our liberties and freedoms. Um, this last weekend, there were 77 NFL players that were tested positive for COVID on 11 teams. All 11 teams rescheduled or canceled their practices because of it, but they had the players retested and all of them came back negative. Uh, all of this hype of creating this mask mandate is based upon new cases, uh, but the new cases, the studies are completely um, unreliable. So you're basing your, your new mandate on unreliable statistics. And, you know, I, I look back at my youth when, uh, there was still the uh, the Cold War with Russia, and I used to think back, how could they possibly limit group gatherings to 10? What did that mean? I couldn't fathom that. And here you are talking about limiting gatherings to 50 people. It's just an arbitrary number, but I hope you can see that what you're doing is, it's, it's unbelievable you're, this is happening in the United States. This is a communism back 50 years ago. Um, I can't understand it. It's just unfathomable. You know, last week I called also, you might remember, I talked about cross-contamination. All these mask wearers that are touching their mask constantly. And if they're touching their mask in the grocery store, if you touch your mask, your hands, if you're stopping COVID in your mask, your hands are now contaminated. You're picking up cans, you're picking up fruit, you're looking at it. You're putting it back. The stalkers are wearing masks. They're touching their masks. And there's so much cross-contamination. You're putting it on the product, and then other buyers, other shoppers are touching that product. Uh, the Thank you. It's Dave. just, yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I hope you listened, read my email that I sent you this week also. Thanks. We have. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, just sorry. unbelievable. Sorry to keep people's to the two minute limit, but that's uh, what we need to do. So we'll go to caller 9250, I'll push star six, you'll unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Blake Tierney. I'm, I'm a lawyer who lives and works here in Provo. And I obviously shop here as well. Um, just a couple comments. I think over the last six months, what's happened, you look at the federal government looked at this issue, they came up with some plans, but ultimately they said, we're gonna let the states decide and let the governors decide. Then our governor has done lots of great efforts on this, but ultimately he said, I'm gonna let the local governments decide. Um, and so it, this really is up to you all uh, to handle. We have an active ongoing pandemic. Um, you know, the citizens in our community are being infected and literally dying in our hospital from it. Uh, and you are exactly the right level of government to handle it. Uh, it's, it's been handed off to you, and, and if you don't, then, then nobody will. So I would encourage you to do so. Um, I, it's been great hearing the input from others on the survey and on the call. I, I think you know it, it's interesting to hear what non-Provo residents, residents have to say, but the, the stat that stood out to me by far the most was 73% of Provo residents support a mask mandate. So, you know, if someone lives somewhere else in Utah County or somewhere else in the state or somewhere else in the country, that, that's great that they have an opinion. 73% of our citizens in the city believe that a mandate should be in place. Um, and so please keep that number in mind. Um, there's no question that you will 
literally save the lives of Provo residents with a, a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller, um, ending in eight, uh, sorry, ending in 1503. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mailing John. I'm living in Provo since I attend BYU. Um, I feel like lots of students want the the mayor to know that they do not want masks. But as a college student, I feel like I can speak for some college students, maybe not the majority, but I really do feel like it is important to keep in mind that we have that as although that we have rights as a citizen, we also have responsibility. And I'm and it's really unfortunate that there's a pandemic going on and people aren't able to socialize. But ultimately, I feel like people's lives are much more important than social gatherings and being able to party and do whatnot. And so I think it's great that you guys are um, putting out this, are thinking about putting out this mandate. I think many lives would be saved. Um, I really feel like we should be following the CDC and the um, World Health Organization's recommendations on masks. I feel like there's a lot of um, propaganda and fear mongering with the masks thinking it's about government control. But ultimately, I feel like this is a matter of a service to the community. And I feel like I love Provo. I love my community. And I just want everyone to be safe. I feel like all lives matter so much. And even one death was such a tragedy. I don't feel like we should we we should have this mask mandate, even if it just saved one person, I think that would be enough. I don't think it's fair to let our um, selfishness get in the lives of other people. I really do believe in believe in serving others through wearing the masks. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, any other comments from the public? Mr. Hanley, there's some attendees on here who haven't raised their hands yet. Just a reminder, if you're trying to call them, star nine, if you want to speak to the camera. I see one now. Uh, caller 3228, go ahead, press star six. Hello. Hello, my name's Jared Curtis. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I'm, uh, I live in Provo. Um, I do not agree with uh, that there should be a mask mandate. Um, I guess I might be selfish or I don't know. Um, yeah, I thought it was interesting that we started this whole thing where uh, we wanted to crush the curve to make sure that the hospitals weren't overrun. Um, I like that, that we got some in, un, unsolicited information from the hospital. Uh, it's weird that we didn't solicitate or solicit more information um, and ask to see if the hospitals were overwhelmed or thought we would be overwhelmed by a large influx of healthy students coming into our valley. Um, uh, just interesting that uh, it doesn't seem like that is the problem. Uh, I don't think that uh, spreading the disease necessarily means more death. I think bad spread to, through the community could mean more death. So people with comorbidities and the, the elderly. Um, I would agree with a mandate to stay in home, those with uh, extreme comorbidities and elderly, to save their lives. Um, otherwise, I think we should uh, go to the next step of herd immunity either through the vaccine and since we don't have one, um, just uh, letting the healthy people uh, get exposed to the virus and uh, weaken the virus so it's less likely to kill some of the older people and the more fragile people. Uh, I, I do have a comorbidity, so I am um, aware that that might uh, inconvenience me, but uh, I do understand the, uh, you guys are in a hard place trying to keep us safe. Um, when it isn't the easiest thing to do politically um, and doing a stay-at-home mandate for older people really hard. Uh, 
society. Um, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I have time. We have time for two more calls, so we'll take 0580 first, and then zero three six one. Go ahead, 05. Uh, the first number I just said. Whatever. Uh, go ahead. Let's see. We have two people. Hello. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Richard. I live in Provo, and I support any effort to get people to wear masks so we can have BYU football this year. We need football. And that's it. Go Cougars. Okay, thank you. Uh, caller 0361, go ahead. Press star six and you'll unmute yourself. Hello? Yes, hello. Okay, my name is Trevor Hall. I live up on Grandview Hill and I'm currently a student at UVU. Um, I am not for mask mandates uh, for a very simple reason is how would the enforcement go? Um, for example, I was in Salt Lake City at the mall across the street from Temple Square. Uh, they have a mask mandate in that mall. Security guard came up and asked me to put on a mask. I said, I'm not going to. And, I, and he's like, well, you'll need to leave. And I responded with, are you really, are we really going to do this? He said to me, no, I don't think we are. Have a nice day. And he walked away with no further problems. Um, so if this does get passed and these mandates are enforced, um, how, how would you go about enforcing it? Would there be people out on the street um, turning people in for not wearing a mask? Would the police be given the ability uh, to write um, citations and fines, uh, would there be, be arrests made? And secondly, um, I think that we should, we as individuals should be able to make choices for our own, not be forced or coerced, uh, into following a law that may or may not be, uh, illegal or a mandate that may or may not be illegal. Um, but that's, that's, that's my primary concern is how would these things be enforced? Because in reality, they can't be. There's too many people in Provo. All right. Thank you very much. All right. That concludes our public comment period. I encourage any, anyone who still wishes to reach out that we will certainly welcome your emails if you have uh, additional comments you'd like to send to us. So we'll bring this back now to um, Council for Discussion. And I'll open it up uh, if uh, there are any comments that the council would like to make. Uh, maybe I'll just address a couple of issues that came up in those questions. Um, and, and if Mr. Jones or Mr. Strachan wanna help clarify my, my thoughts here, that would be helpful. But uh, there, and I think Mr. Harding already sort of addressed this a little bit, but there seems to be some perception that this is, lim uh, you know, banning public gatherings. Um, uh, and uh, the, the point is not to ban public gatherings, but to require uh, certain compli with compliance with the health guidelines precisely so that those gatherings can take place safely. Uh, I would say the same thing is true for uh, businesses, athletic events, uh, other things that we're talking about. Um, but I don't know if Mr. Jones or Mr. Strachan can add at any additional information there that would be helpful to clarify that issue. Uh, Chair Hanley, I was having a slight technical difficulty and missed part of the question. Can you uh, repeat what you wanted me to address? Yeah, just the perception that the ordinance is intended to um, prevent public gatherings. And I'm just sort of wanting to make sure that the public understands there is no ban on oh. public gatherings, but there is uh, are specific requirements for uh, either mass or social distancing or both under certain conditions. Um, yeah. The point yeah, being, I, yeah, public right. can happen and they can happen more safely or uh, athletic events could happen more safely if we follow the guidelines. Yes, I'd be happy to address that. So uh, that was discussed earlier. I think it was Councillor Harding that asked about that earlier. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd just reiterate that, first of all, with regard to the current draft of the ordinance, with regard to outdoor events, only uh, applies where social distancing is not uh, possible. 
reasonable or prudent. With regard to indoor events, um, the only thing that has, the only requirement that has to do with large gatherings is that if there's a ga gathering of more than 50 people occurring indoors, then masks must be worn even if social distancing is, is reasonably possible. That doesn't do anything to prohibit the, um, the uh, gathering from taking place. It just uh, clarifies uh, that in those particular instances, uh, masks must be worn. You know, I think that's fairly common with a lot of uh, uh, church congregations, for example, right now, that, those so that masks are being required even though social distancing is also being uh, practiced. Uh, I think with regard to some of the things that Mr. Strachan mentioned earlier, that's been recommended even for things like uh, sporting events and, and other things. But none of that, none, there's nothing in the ordinance that prohibits any such activity from taking place as long, long as masks are worn. And could you address the question of enforcement in this ordinance? Uh, well, I can, I can tell you what the ordinance says about uh, the penalty. Uh, with regard to the actual enforcement, that's going to be a question for the administration. But, what the, but addressing the, the first point, uh, what the ordinance says about penalties is that um, violations of the ordinance are a civil infraction, uh, which is not, not criminal in nature and is uh, subject to a fine. The maximum fine for an individual um, is $55. The maximum fine for the organizer of an event who does not require attendees to wear masks or post notice of the requirement to wear masks. And again, we're only talking about indoor events larger than 50 people. The organizer of such event could be, sub could be subject to a fine of up to $500 for failing to uh, require attendees to wear masks or post notice of that requirement. And Mr. Strachan, do you have some information about the Salt Lake County's experience with that? take the screen here. Salt Lake County today um, heard a report uh, from one of their staffers talking about what, how um, they're progressing in their effort to reduce the number of cases. Um, back in late June, they imposed a mandate because their numbers had been uh, climbing. They continued to climb for another uh, couple of, well, another week or so. Uh, and then they hit a peak around July 6th, July 12th, and then started declining once the mask mandate went into place. And since their peak in July, th their case count has dropped 52%. Their hospitalizations have dropped 68%. Their recovered is improving. Uh, but this is the one I think is important to see. Um, the green line points to where the last date that they had um, before they put the, the mandate up, or sorry, the mandate's right here. And then you'll see it climb for another week or so, um, you know, as cases, uh, as cases, uh, I don't know what the right word is, incubated. Uh, and then since then, they've had a, a pretty dramatic uh, decline. One of the things that they did know, they talked about some of the things that were important that face coverings have been determined as an effective tool. Now they've been surveying 130 to 150 locations around the county to see, try and get a sense of how many people, what percentage of people are wearing their masks. Um, they, they talk about why face coverings, they talk about face coverings along with social distancing, washing hands and staying home when sick are important factors. Uh, they note their mandate went in June 27th um, they've seen an, a, a dramatic re reduction in their cases. And then they also had this slide that I thought was interesting. The blue line represents where Salt Lake County was in relation to Utah, uh, the, the, the rest of Utah. And uh, they have now gone, uh, they are now down below um, the cases. Now, they're still probably the biggest case because of population size, um, but they have had uh, real success as they've gone through their mandate. Those are the slides we discussed earlier. Okay, thank you. Any uh, further discussion? Um, I'm wondering if we should return to the specific uh, 
issues that were mentioned earlier about household um, groups um, and about signs. Mr. Sewell, uh, you're muted. Thank you. Regarding the household groups, I would like to propose uh, an additional exemption and I would defer to uh, Brian on how this would be worded, but something to the effect that the social distancing and mask wearing requirements don't apply between residents living together in the same household. I would second that if Mr. Jones feels that's uh, adequate language. Yeah, I, I think that uh, that's easy enough to do. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think through exactly where to put the language and whether it's an exemption or whether to include it in the requirement paragraph itself. But I think while I think that through, um, if you wanna go ahead and discuss and vote on the motion about whether the council as a whole wants that change made, then I can propose some uh, specific language. Any discussion to that motion? All right, seeing none, um, I'll call for a vote on that motion. And I'll, let's see, I'll, get my, uh, I'll, I'll vote first and vote yes, Mr. Harding. Yes. Ms. Ellsworth. Yes. Mr. Fillmore. Yes. Mr. Hoban. Yes. Mr. Sewell. Yes. Mr. Shipley. Yes. All right, the voting is unanimous, so we'll have that um, uh, amendment. Uh, Brian can come back with that language. Um, how about uh, talking about the signs issue? Uh, is there further discussion on that? Yeah. Ms. Ellsworth. I think it was uh, Mr. Jones's recommendation at one point, or perhaps it was Mr. Fillmore's recommendation that we strike section two of 9.25.050 that states businesses shall post a notice provided by the city unless the business chooses to provide its own notice, which must clearly indicate where face coverings are required under this chapter. Does that, that would exclude the city from responsibility in providing signage, is that correct? Is, there, is somebody who can help answer that question? Mr. Jones, if we wanted to exclude the city from having responsibility of providing signage, could we simply remove section two, which is lines 204 and 205 under posting? Yes, yes. And that, that wouldn't change anything about a business's obligation other than they would have a, an obligation to, they wouldn't, um, as currently, in, sorry, let me rephrase. As currently included, that subsection would say that it's, would essentially say that business didn't have an obligation to post a sign until the city um, provides it for them unless they want to, unless they want to provide their own. But if you delete that section, then the posting requirement stays the same. And if in the interim, the administration or the council staff uh, does something to help businesses with signage, then they can certainly do that. And, uh, and help out that way, but there's no need for that necessarily to be in the ordinance. So I would move that we remove section two under posting that includes lines 204 and 205. All right, do we have a second of that motion? I will second that. All right, uh, any discussion of that motion? I see Mr. Sewell has his hand up. I assume that's on this topic. Yes, my, my only concern is I just wanted to make sure a small business doesn't uh, feel like it's a burden that now I've got to go hire somebody to design me a flyer and print it out. So as long as we have an understanding here, uh, if council staff even is willing to put something together and make it available so businesses don't have to do that, then if they don't want to, and then I'm, I'm fine with it. I think I, it would, oh, go, sorry. 
I was just going to say, I think I feel the same. Um, I think I, I like, I like the uniformity seems important here, sort of clarity of the same mes- message. Um, so I do think to the degree that we can help with that, that's good. Sorry, go ahead, Ms. Ellsworth. I was just going to say, I think it would be ideal if the council staff put together a template that was easily available online. Um, but other stores that don't want to use the city template wouldn't be required to. So I, I, um, I'm more comfortable removing that section too, so that businesses can move forward without waiting for the city. All right. Any, any further discussion of this motion? Okay. Seeing none, I will uh, call for vote on the motion. I'll begin with Mr. Harding. Yes. Ms. Ms. Ellsworth. Yes. Mr. Fillmore. Yes. Mr. Hoven. Yes. Ms. Sewell. Yes. And Mr. Shipley. Yes. I will vote yes. All right, that was unanimous. Uh, Mr. Hoban. Um, thank you. I, I was just going to have some discussion. Is not a good time for that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, first of all, I have to say thank you to the staff and also all the council members. I, I'm not sure the public really knows what we've all been through the last seven days <laughs> um, with trying to, you know, dig up information and and consult and and go back and forth on emails and. I know probably some of you feel the way I feel that it's been difficult to even get my day time, uh, my day job done. Um, but I, so I, I just want to say thank you to the staff who's spent countless hours and also to the council members. I, I, I just think everyone has taken this really seriously. Um, I, I think it's clear that I've been kind of the, the black sheep of the group here. I've been um, the last couple of days, uh, opposed to the man to the mandate or ordinance as is, and it's um, it's interesting because I think when when people hear that they think I'm anti-mask or something like that, um, or that I have some you know government conspiracy theory in my head or something like that. Um, but this this really has no, has nothing to do with the efficacy of you know the effectiveness of masks and such. I. Um, my, my concerns with the ordinance, um, have been more so around process and, and then some of the, uh, pieces of the ordinance, um, and also regarding, um, you know, getting buy-in and, and participation from key stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> and so I wanted to share some of those concerns. I know many of you have heard them, um, but I think for the benefit of the public, you know, as I proceed to get roasted here over the next few days, <laughs> uh, I think it might be it might be appropriate for me to kind of share some of those thoughts. Um, and I, I think I want to say that I, I fully believe in the effectiveness effectiveness of mass. I do believe that the students coming are going to pose a unique threat um, to you know our COVID situation. And so I do think we need to take some sort of action. So I want, I want to start there. Um, some of the concerns I had, I think this process has felt kind of like a, a shoot then aim approach. And I understand we're, we're under intense urgency here um, with students arriving in a week. And so this situation or this, whatever we came up with was never going to be perfect. Um, I appreciate you all, uh, including an exemption for family units. Um, I'm, I'm glad we could add that in. Um, I, I think it's never going to be perfect. I, my concern is that we may have approached this in possibly the, um, the opposite way that, that I was hoping. Um, so I want to talk about a few different things. One is, um, is I guess having no sunset to this, um, no end date in sight. That's a, a specific concern for me because though we can always extend a mandate 
Um, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of having to justify ending a mandate. I think we should have to justify continuing a mandate as opposed to ending a mandate. Justify ending a mandate. Um, I would have preferred we have some sort of approach where uh, perhaps every two to three months we have to renew this mandate. Um, that, that request kind of fell on deaf ears. I, I also, uh, in all fairness, was hoping for some sort of sunrise mandate, which I can address in a minute, but um, to not have an end to me feels uh, something, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. Um, and I know that some feel that we're gonna need this mandate. Uh, I just got a chat that says there is an end, there is an end and you all need to decide when it will end. Um, okay, I'll look into that. Uh, line 230. Sorry, I'm doing this on the fly, but if we could go to line 230, Brian. I was just told there is an end date. Can somebody pull no, that up? No, there is no, there is not an end date. There's a mandatory review date in October, in the first meeting of October, but that does not repeal or end the ordinance. Right. No, that's my understanding. So there's no end date to this. There's a review where we'll take a look at it, but I think the review is. Uh, is not a renew. <laughs> it's not a re-justification. Um, and so for me, that's a big concern. I'll move on from that. Um, we are acting alone in this. Um, we have no support from the administration, from the chief of police. We have, do not have support of the Chamber of Commerce. These are the businesses that we're supposedly doing this mandate for to help keep them open. And I agree, that's what we want to do. We want to keep our kids safe. We want to keep our businesses open, our schools open. Um, so again, I believe in masks. I believe they help. I'm concerned about the process, right? I'm concerned about the key stakeholder buy-in. Um, in the research that we were presented with Ben Abbott, a, a professor from BYU, um, it, we've been using his research to kind of um, talk about uh, how we should approach this and such. He, he confirmed that the, the buy-in and, and support of the administration increases effectiveness of mandates. Um, I would venture to say that we're doing a disservice to ourselves by not finding a way to get buy-in from the administration. I know that there were talks with the administration around um, a mandate that would, uh, would approach the most egregious um, uh, you know, offenders, those who are throwing big parties, let's be honest, that's how this all started. The young and dumb party happened. And they said, well, we threw a party because there was no mandate against it. And, uh, and, and, and so we decided we needed to address this. Um, I know that there were talks to the administration about doing something around uh, targeting large events where it's most likely to spread and most likely have a large impact on the COVID situation. Um, and I think it's, we, we have done ourselves a disservice and the people of Provo a disservice by not having administrative support uh, or support of the businesses as well. If you look at Salt Lake's mandate, many people will point to that and say it's been effective. Well, guess what? The council and the administration, the chief of police, the chamber of commerce are all on the same page. We are not, we're acting alone. I think we should have taken some time, uh, whether it even be a few more days, I'm not sure. It, I'm not saying weeks or months. Um, to find a way to come to a consensus there. I think, I think that's a big miss on our part. That's one of the reasons I'm having trouble supporting the mandate. Um, I've mentioned a couple times that I feel like we're making this decision in somewhat of an information vacuum. I know that I, I wanna commend everyone on the council and all the staff members, they have done their best to try to dig up as much information as possible in the limited amount of time that we've had. Um, but there is an information gap here, and I'm not talking about information on the effectiveness of masks and all of that. Please understand, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about information specific to Provo, specific to BYU. Um, I'm talking about things like we have not met with the county health department. No one has to discuss this, to discuss what metric we might use 
to determine when there's an issue with COVID cases, uh, when, when there's a, a concern. Um, we have not met with decision makers at the IHC uh, hospital group to discuss how they will uh, sound, the, when they will sound the alarm, when is, you know, when, what are they looking at as a metric? Um, we have had some information from BYU professors around, you know, the effectiveness of uh, mask mandates and things like that. I'm very appreciative of that. And I've shared that information on my Facebook page and, and I think it's very useful. Um, but just even today, those same researchers sent us updated information and we've been using their information to guide our, to guide this process. They sent it today and said, oh, well, we just redid our models. We've removed 4,000 to 6,000 students from this research model and everything has changed. Instead of there being an outbreak in the first month that BYU students arrive, there will be an out outbreak sometime probably by Thanksgiving. That changes everything. We've gone from fearing and acting upon this fear that we were going to have an outbreak within the first few weeks to now looking at it within towards the end of the semester. And actually that's when students will be heading home this Thanksgiving. Um, I think we're making decisions off of lack of information and sometimes bad information. Again, do I think we need to wear more masks? Yes, people should be wearing more masks. I am concerned with how we're going about the decision and the process we're going about this and how we're trying to rush this when he perhaps even a few more days might have made an impact. Um, the, we just received information today from BYU. We haven't had a lot of discourse. I do want to commend Representative Harding and Hanley or Council Member Hanley and Harding for trying to engage BYU. Um, and they did have some engagement. But, but today we found we received some very important information around how many beds they have, how many uh, or isolation beds they have, how they'll be approaching things, um, what they're planning to do around sporting events, that's still unknown. So here we might have a mandate <laughs> for outdoor events that are gonna require people to be six feet apart. And we have had no conversations with BYU around how they're gonna keep people at football games six feet apart. Um, I, again, uh, we're, we're lack of information, lack of preparation. We're shooting, then aiming. Um, the, you know, I talk, I talk about lack of information. We have not discussed a metric around when we'll end this. So we have in there that we're going to discuss this again in October. Um, but how are we going to evaluate it off of our gut feel? What numbers are we going to use? Could we take a day to figure this out. I'm not talking weeks. I'm not talking months. I'm talking taking a little bit more time to be more thoughtful about this process instead of just acting um, on gut feel. Um, now, I know there's some time that we can decide that. I would agree. Um, but I think we're going into this without any plan in place as far as how we're going to decide when to take this, uh, remove this. That concerns me. Um, and we don't have the metrics. We received no information specific to Provo regarding COVID cases. Um, that's shocking to me. Uh, we have not been given any information. We, we, we were free to try to look that up ourselves, but um, how are we gonna even gauge how we're doing? Um, it's just, these are the some of the concerns I have. Um, I, I think, uh, specifically in regards to, you know, some of the nuances of this. Look, if uh, well, I, I guess I've, I've probably spoken a lot enough. Um, I, I would have liked to have seen us try to come together with the administration, something that targeted large groups specifically because they're the most egregious offenders. That's what we really are concerned about. That's what spurred this. Um, that to me would have been a very, uh, you know, targeted mandate that could have had a, a an impact, or or at least that's how we, you know, we feel we could have. Um, I would have liked to seen a sunrise and or sunset clause. Um, all of this has fallen kind of on deaf ears, and and I, I'm disappointed in that. Um, I I do think process is important. I think um, precedent's important. I think. Um, how we're approaching this, even if we had just taken 
a few more days to get some additional information, some key metrics together, things like that. Um, at this point, my vote is mute. Uh, I, I know that there are enough votes to pass this, um, and I think I'm going alone at this. <laughs> and so that's all right. I'm comfortable with that. Um, I, I would be willing to, um, I guess, try to find some sort of compromise. Um, and I think that's beneficial for Provo. I, I think we can still act today. We can still make something that is meaningful, that makes a difference, um, while at the same time giving us some time to um, put this together in the right way and make data-driven decisions and, and make uh, take the approach that I think is going to be most beneficial long-term and is within our role. Uh, to not have a sunset or something like that is, is so strange to me um, that we're just gonna leave this, let this go indefinitely. Um, you know, it's a simple thing we could do to keep ourselves accountable. Uh, there's there's some things we could do, but um, just wanted to make sure and share that. And again, say thank you to everyone, even uh, even those I disagree with. You know, it's been a great discourse, and I feel like um, ultimately, um, you know, I know that everyone on this on this council has the best interest of uh, the provost, the people of Provo's best interest in heart. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. If it's okay, there are three hands up, but I would like to respond uh, first, if that's all right with my council members, uh, fellow council members. There are a couple of things you said that I want to give specific responses to that I think were misinterpreted in the studies that you referred to. First of all, Ben Abbott, in his study, he said, uh, in response to govern governmental decisions seems to be the rule, not the exception, with response to COVID-19 cases in the U.S., at the community, state, and federal level, there are abundant examples of the legislature limiting the executive branch and the other way around. The bright side of this unfortunate situation is that the effect size of mandates estimated by the studies cited in the last section probably are applicable to a divided or conflicted mandate, such as the one under consideration by the council. Though there are not many quantitative estimates, it seems clear that governmental division decreases but does not negate the effectiveness of mandates. And, and secondly, right. I said, I said the support of the administration increases effectiveness. So, uh, well, I wanted to clarify, it doesn't negate the effectiveness. And second, no, I never said it did. Hold on. Uh, Dr. Sloan's study uh, was assuming a city mandate. That's why the results came out so much better. So you misread that. Um, they did know she said in there that there, there she changed 4,000 that she removed 4,000 to 6,000 students from the model. Let me finish my point. I'm acknowledging that, but, but you, you neglected to say that the reason why things looked so much better by Thanksgiving was because her model assumed that a, uh, a, a, a mask ordinance was gonna be passed. That's a very significant difference. You just, no, that wasn't, stated, that wasn't stated in her study. Will you pull up the email and we can take a look at that? Then nowhere is that stated. Nowhere is what? She says, she says, Nowhere in, in her email is it stated that the mandate is what made the numbers change. She states that a mandate will help, but she states clearly that we have removed four to 6,000 students. So yeah. that's what has made the change significant. Not allowing me, allowing me to finish my point, Mr. Hoban, so I'd appreciate it. She does, I'm okay. saying that she didn't drop those numbers, but I'm saying those numbers, uh, the numbers of infections and numbers of cases that she is, uh, predicting is based on the assumption that we would have a mandate. The numbers of students that were dropped uh, from the study was based on the assumption that with closures, we would have fewer students in Provo. And I will remind everyone that a closure happens because the cases start to rise very quickly. And that's precisely what we're trying to avoid. So I think the, the issue of timeliness here is key because it, it, it is assuming uh, that it, it, it is very, it's very clear that the sooner we act, the better. Um, and and I, in my, all my conversations with BYU, by the way, with regard to events, there's no question that they're going to be as strict or more strict about following the, the phased guidelines provided by the state and county than, than anybody. So if they're going to hold events, they're certainly going to be following the very same rules that they've already instituted. 
Um, and, and I do think that large groups may, uh, you know, may have been that a, the dance party initiated this conversation mm -hmm. in some ways, although uh, I personally was having this conversation long before uh, that happened. And it is the individual collective behavior that makes uh, as much of a difference, if not more, over the long term than just single events. Single events, we do have to worry about a great deal, but they're not the only things that we have to worry about. So I do think that's one reason why this, why this is uh, important. Um, and I think we can have a healthy discussion at a later point about a, a metric. I can only say that I think there's so many contingencies to be taking into consideration. One is how many students will we have a month from now? Uh, we don't even know that. There's no way we can know that now. Um, but certainly most everybody agrees that you look at cases, you look at um, uh, positivity rate, you look at ho uh, hospitalizations and beds, and you make the best judgment you can. And I think at that point, we would have um, uh, lots of conversations with all of the, all of the interested parties on this. Let me just, let me just say a few things I, uh, about this in general. And I, I think it's, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that this is a very difficult time. And I think a lot of people are feeling a lot of understandable fear and frustration and uh, even anger about something that is very hard to control and to get rid of. And I think there's been a great temptation, not only in our community, but throughout the country to turn on each other as a result when there is essentially no one to blame for the disease, or at least of all for its ability to spread and its ability to cause harm to people and even take lives. Um, so I would just plead with this community uh, that if we do pass ordinance tonight, that we continue to do our very best to treat each other with kindness and respect and we listen to each other uh, as much as we can. And I think as a council, we have been listening. As, as Mr. Strachan mentioned, we've received over 4,000 comments from Open City Hall and hundreds of emails and many phone calls. I still think it needs, unfortunately, to keep being repeated um, uh, that the, the common flu and, and uh, COVID-19 are not, not the same thing. Uh, frankly, a lot of students have been writing us just today, acting, uh, speaking as if this is not a serious issue, which is precisely why I think this ordinance is necessary. They did not help their cause by speaking irresponsibly about what it might mean for them to be uh, not following the health guidelines. Common flu kills between 40 and 50,000 people a year on average, and over 170,000 people have died of COVID-19 in just six months. And that is after stay at home orders and lots and lots of efforts to social distance and wear masks. In fact, that's one of the reasons I think that it's safe to say that we avoided the problems with hospitalizations and uh, that we were worried about when this first came. So when people want me to believe that this isn't any more serious than the flu, my heart just sinks. There really is uh, no serious scientific debate about the existence of, of the pandemic and its seriousness, about the effectiveness of mask wearing, and I know that that is not the, the discourse here in our city leadership, but there is a lot of that in our community. And I think that needs to be uh, acknowledged. Uh, there isn't even, frankly, scientific, serious scientific debate about the effectiveness of mask ordinances in improving compliance and saving lives. I've said this before, but I think the burden of proof is on those who would not want to, an ordinance to show why that is the safe and prudent and um, most effective way to protect the welfare of our community. I certainly respect everybody's right to disagree, but as a city, I believe we have a responsibility to follow the general consensus of scientific communities and the results of professional peer-reviewed research and not lone or stray voices. And we've, made, we've uh, investigated this clearly, both in terms of general research and local examples that mandates uh, improve compliance by as much as 15 to 20%. In the case of Salt Lake County, that uh, compliance moved from 65% to 95% by virtue of passing the ordinance. That's quite a jump. And that means when we get higher rates of compliance, as we've talked about on the council, if we get up to 80% compliance, the effectiveness of mass is multiplied. Um, so by some estimates, mass ordinances have saved the lives of up to 10 10 to 20% of those who otherwise would have died. I, I think that makes it worth it uh, in and of itself. But one study showed that 200,000 lives have been saved in America 
by virtue of various mask ordinances throughout the country. Um, and, th and those, those percentages, those lives saved in, um, pay off over time as compliance remains in place during the length of the pandemic. And as I mentioned, to get, we, we sort of have this golden goal of 80% compliance, and it's hard to know why we should have confidence that we can get there without it, especially again with so many students arriving, up to 40,000 in, in Provo alone. There doesn't seem to be any serious scientific debate about the fact that tens of thousands of students arriving in our city would put us at serious risk and requires a serious plan. I can't overstate that. I don't wanna blame students, but student lifestyles and living conditions are a ideal circumstance for the transmission of this disease. Everyone that we've spoken to has made that clear to us. And I, I, don't, I want them to stay here in Provo. I wanna keep our businesses going. I want them to be employed in our businesses. I want everything to stay open. We don't need any more shutdown, uh, but we don't have a plan in place. We're assuming that the status quo is adequate and I think that's, that's not true. We don't have a plan in place and that's on us. Uh, Utah County Health Department didn't warn us to have such a plan either and frankly, that's on them. BYU and the State Health Department haven't asked us to have an ordinance. That's also true, but that is only because they have deferred to our decision-making authority. We're not obligated to believe that their neutrality means that they don't think it would be a good idea. Indeed, the governor's office, the County Health Department, the IHC, the LDS Church, BYU, UVU, and our school district, and many businesses already subscribe to a mask mandate within their organizations. And I'll just read to you what our... Um, what, uh, what BYU recently said to their students. I can pull this up. Um, the simple truth is that if we want any kind of in-person semester, we need to be vigilant. If we aren't and the virus spreads too quickly through our campus community like it has at others, BYU may need to go back to remote instruction. We have previously shared that going remote at any time is still a possibility depending on the spread of the virus. If we can gather safely, we want you here on campus. We want to be together. If we cannot, going remote again could be necessary. I think we would all agree that's not ideal. And, and everyone knows, BYU and UVU and all of our schools know that there's only so much they can do to impose uh, expectations on site, but what happens off site matters just as much. So I just wonder, can anyone seriously doubt that these organizations wouldn't welcome Provo City to be on the same page? Um, so I, again, I think it's a mistake to assume that we, we can do, uh, uh, maintain the status quo. I certainly, there are lots of worries about how it might affect businesses and I don't wanna stigmatize people or criminalize, criminalize people if they can't or won't comply. But I think our ordinance does that. Nearly universal mask wearing will not only save lives, it is the only way to keep our way of life going under the pandemic. We have evidence to believe that people want uh, in the majority to solicit businesses that take this seriously. If there is a citywide ordinance, all businesses will have to comply. And I, have a, I, I, I doubt seriously that anyone would uh, boycott any business because they're subject to a city ordinance. I think the uniformity of the ordinance helps to clarify the expectations and puts everyone on the same plane. I think everyone wants the confidence that their city is looking out for health and general welfare of the public. And so I would call upon my fellow counselors to pass this ordinance tonight. And I hope and, and plead with the administration that they will execute it as soon as we can. Uh, we've already delayed our response uh, in, to the arrival of students and every passing day is a lost opportunity to prevent more suffering and, and save more lives. So I would make a motion that we pass this ordinance tonight uh, as it has been amended, and I'll leave it at that. Mr. Uh, Fillmore. <clears throat> I, I'd just like to direct a, a couple of comments to Mr. Hoban. I, I appreciate the fact that uh, Mr. Hoban acknowledges that it would be a good thing, un an unqualifiedly good thing, if we can increase the, the number of people in our city wearing masks. Uh, it's, uh, as I understand what Travis is saying, it's just about how we go about it where he is concerned. Uh, I, I do want to express a fundamental disagreement with some of the general comments he made about lack of support in the community. Uh, there have been conversations, there have been discussions of studies, 
there have been uh, discussions at uh, many levels and many of the local institutions who are already implementing mask mandates are hoping that we will do something that's uh, supportive of that. Uh, they acknowledge in private conversations that their efforts will be largely undone if their students, for example, leave their campuses and uh, return to their uh, residential complexes or go downtown shopping or recreate facilities in a way where they, where they will be exposed. Uh, I mean, this, what we're trying to do is find ways to protect not just townspeople, but the students. It's a symbiotic relationship. It goes both ways. And uh, I, for one, feel a need to support those institutions that uh, are hoping that uh, we will have comparable protections. Uh, I, I, my question for Mr. Hoban, having, having said all that, uh, do you have a motion for us with respect to the sunset provision? That seemed to be your primary focus earlier today. Go ahead, Mr. Hoban. Uh, I do, but I think there's a motion on table. I, I guess I could submit a substitute motion. I, I, I'm not sure the um, if I'm out of line there. Procedurally, before we do that, there, we would need to first wait and see if there's a second right. to the motion that's been made. Right. Uh, Mr. Sewell, so, have you up next? Um, well, let's see here. We've got a motion on the table. I, I was hoping we could uh, address some of these other issues before we had that motion. Otherwise, so, well, let's... So let me, yeah, let me just weigh in procedurally and say that no motion is necessary because there is an implied motion under the rules of the council for the approval of the ordinance anyway. Right. Um, Chair Handley can certainly, um, you know, jump ahead to that point by by making that motion now. Uh, but procedurally at this point, the two best options would be either for someone to second that motion or for the motion to fail by, by not having a second or for Chair Handley to withdraw the motion given that there is an implied motion at the end of the discussion. Well, I would, I would not want to foreclose the opportunity if there are any other proposed amendments to the draft. So I, I'm happy to, to wait to make that motion. Okay, uh, it sounds like the motion has been withdrawn then. Um, I'll go on to my question for Mr. Hoban. I actually had several, but the first one relates to what Mr. Fillmore said. If you do have a motion uh, with respect to the sunset clause, I'd like to hear it. Okay, I'll do my best here. Uh, um, knowing that I'm kind of, um, going solo on this uh, in the opposition to the mandate as is i uh, just you know would like to repeat that um not opposition i'm not opposing I, i'm i i'm in favor of a uh, a targeted mandate but in any case the mandate as proposed currently the ordinance as proposed currently i'm in opposition to that and, and uh, I, I would like to perhaps try to get something a win out of this <laughs> um and I guess my motion would be to um, change from it being uh, that that it will be reviewed um, in the first October council meeting to it it's sunsetting at that time, meaning the ordinance um, would no longer be in effect, and that we at that point would then have the option to renew the ordinance. Um, and, and let me explain why I, I would like to do this, because I feel like it would give us some time to evaluate the data, to put a better, perhaps a plan together to get stakeholders on board and um, to come at this slightly more informed. Um, I, I, would it change anything? I'm not sure. Would it change anything about the ordinance? I'm not sure. But I think it, it gives us the impetus to take a serious look as opposed to um, just going comfortably with the status quo. So I'm not sure if I stated that motion correctly or if that's sufficient, but I guess my motion would be to, um, instead of it being 
reviewed in the first council meeting. It would be sunset at the first council meeting and then renewed if the council so chose. I will second that motion. All right, is there Thank any question to that motion? I, I have, a, I have a, a question on that. Um, you know, we, right now we are looking at uh, a, a delay in implementation of, of any ordinance that we pass now. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear maybe from Mr. Jones, um, if we had that provision, would that mean that, you know, so, so it sunsets the first meeting in October, but we, we decide to renew it. Would there be a gap uh, before that renewal gets signed or by renewing it in, in October, would it, would it stay, um, you know, would, it, would, would it not have a gap? Would it, would it just continue on? Um, my proposal, if that motion were appro be approved, would be to write a termination uh, provision that says that the ordinance shall terminate as of October, uh, as of midnight on October 6th, well, 11.59 p.m. on October 6th, unless uh, this provision is sooner repealed. And, um, uh, well, there might be a more elegant way to, to, to think about that. But to answer your question, as I, as I figure out a way to do that, if the motion passes, my intent would not to be that at, in October, on October 6th, you have to pass a new ordinance but that on October 6th, you would change the sunset provision, which would then keep the ordinance in effect. Okay, if, if that's the case, if, if we're able to continue, the, the, have the continuity of, of the requirements, um, as long as we don't let it lapse through inaction, um, I'd actually uh, be interested in having a, a two month review ongoing until it uh, sunsets or until it's no longer valid. So, so perhaps like the first meeting of, of each even month, um, it, it will discontinue unless we take some affirmative action um, at the first meeting of each, of each even month. That way um, we're not in the same predicament early October, but you know, and having to set another deadline, but just set that in that every two months we either have to renew it or or it um, or it discontinues, and that there's continuity as long as we are actively um, continuing it. Mr. Strachan, did you want to add something? Yeah, it's actually a question for Brian. And Brian, in terms of the date. Um, I understand October 6th because that's the meeting date, but with the timeline, time frame that the mayor has to sign or veto or or let pass into law, um, would you not want to have an actual expiry date um, up to two weeks after that so it stays in effect until such time as the mayor makes her decision? Well, again, to go back to, to Mr. Harding's question, and, and I haven't figured out the exact language of this, but my uh, my intent would be to couch it in such a way that the only thing the mayor had the opportunity to veto would be the, the renewal. I mean, not, no, not the renewal. That the only thing that she would have the opportunity to veto would be um, the fact that it expires. But, I, but I'm working on that as, as we go. But you, what you've raised is another possibility. And that's another possible way to do it. I think more importantly... What I need at the moment, rather than, than telling me the specific mechanism for doing so, is just an expression from the council, if it is the will of the council, that um, the, the ordinance expire if not renewed uh, on October 6th. And then if that's, if that's the concrete desire, we'll figure out a mechanism for doing it. Would Mr. Hoban be open or others be open to a, a slightly longer one? Uh, because it seems to me October is very early. Uh, there's really only a little over a month of, of data that we would have at that point. Um, could we go late October? Is there another meeting in October? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have my schedule. Out. The second meeting in October is October 20th. Sounds good to me. And I would Again, my intent, my intent is that. just to, oh, thank you, Bill. 
My concern is that the date that it expires is arbitrary until we review the data that we compile after implementation. So it's okay if we periodically review it, I think that's smart, but setting a date today is very arbitrary when we have not had the chance to review it. So I feel like we should not set a sunset that soon because we are just creating an arbitrary deadline. I, I would agree, Shannon, that it's somewhat of an arbitrary deadline, but we need a deadline. And yeah. I think, uh, I think going to the end of October with an option to renew it is perfectly reasonable. We will have, should have hopefully plenty of data by then. Yeah, could we push it to November? I would not say November that. will be November 10th. Um, if I may. Sure, go ahead. Um, I, I think my intent with having it slightly early on is um, to kind of force uh, a little bit more movement in in some of the things I, I'm hoping to see happen with stakeholders and, and data gathering and not necessarily Shan uh, Mrs. Ells Mrs. Ellsworth Miss Ellsworth sorry I got yelled at for that uh, last time <laughs> but, your your audio went out. No, can't hear you. Oh, we Let's try you. speaker. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I think um, I can appreciate what Miss Miss Ellsworth is saying around uh, not having enough data at that point. But I'm hoping actually that we um, accomplish a few things um, even before reviewing data from success of the mandate or whatever it might be. So that's why I'm pushing for something a little earlier, um, if that explains at all why the October date? Um, well, oh, go ahead. Right. Just in response to your uh, good intentions of, of getting more consensus with different community stakeholders, uh, I think that's valuable to a point, but I don't think that it's necessary for us to do our job and to make a decision and to reevaluate uh, without retiring the ordinance. Um, the school district, the Provo City School District is one of our partners and they do a lot of really important, very phenomenal work that sometimes feels like it overlaps with Provo City. Um, however, when they were making their back to school plans, they didn't call us. At least they didn't call me. Maybe they called you six and they left me out. Um, but they moved ahead and they made plans and then they remade plans and they didn't really ask for our permission or our endorsement. They just presented it to us as them doing the best they could with the information they had. And similarly, BYU didn't ask for our permission to make their standards and they don't need to. And we don't need to ask for their permission or endorsement uh, despite them being a phenomenal partner. And again, them going above and beyond what the city is even doing to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. So while I appreciate the opportunity and future opportunities to coordinate with these stakeholders, I don't think it's essential um, for us to shape and create laws that the citizens elected us to create. Mr. Sewell. Um, I just wanted to clarify where we were at on the motion. So it sounded like Mr. Hoban was willing to amend his motion to be the second uh, meeting in October. And it, I thought I heard Mr. Fillmore getting ready to second that amendment, but I wanted to ask Mr. Hoban if he was willing to also incorporate Mr. Harding's concept that it would be in every two month uh, sunset unless we took some affirmative action that Mr. Jones will tell us about to keep it going. Yes, yeah, so I guess I would amend my own motion to uh, state that we'll have a, it will sunset October 
20th. And then we would review the second, what would we call it? The second, um, the second meeting of every other month, uh, that it would continue to sunset the second meeting of every other month and have to be, take some sort of affirmative action as Mr. Harding stated, uh, to continue the mask mandate. And I will second that. All right. Question about the uh, motion. All right. I'll for a vote on that. Um, Wait, I, I, I'd like to comment on that as well. Um, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, you know, part of what we're trying to achieve is not just pass a good law, but build community support and uh, well, and support of elected officials, obviously, as well. But um, I don't know, there's just kind of a subtle message there that uh, that we have to go through this process and, you know, we have to schedule a meeting and take an action if we want to keep it going. And I'm, I'm comfortable with making that e extra effort every two months to make sure that we feel like it's really still needed. Ms. Ellsworth. Yeah, I do appreciate the review element. I think that's absolutely critical. My question to Mr. Hoven is, if we approve this sunset provision, would you vote for the ordinance in total? Yeah, I think obviously I've stated my concerns with the ordinance and, and knowing that I'm on an island here. Uh, I think the best thing I can do at this point is try to try to make it better. And so because of that, uh, I'll support it if we can approve the motion. All right, any further discussion of the amended motion? All right, I'll call for a vote. Um, we'll begin with Ms. Ellsworth. Yes. Mr. Fillmore. Yes. Mr. Hoban. Yes. Mr. Sewell. Yes. Mr. Shipley. Yes. I will vote yes. Uh, George Handley and Mr. Harding. Yes. Our vote is unanimous. Mr. Fillmore. Uh, I, I would like to proffer a couple of amendments if I could. Uh, first, I would like to, uh, this is pursuant to an email I sent out earlier today. I would like to amend section 9.25010. Uh, I would like to uh, insert some wording on the second line where it talks about requiring all individuals living within uh, or, or visiting Provo, I'd like to insert living or working with or, live, or visiting Provo. That's the first one. And the second one in that section would be on the next to last line after the phrase in attendance at large gatherings. I would like to insert the phrase where social distancing is not possible, reasonable, or prudent. Okay, any, any second on that? Mr. Harding? Um, so, Mr. Jones, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, paragraph or the, the section 010 is just kind of a, just discusses the purpose, and so it doesn't really get down into the, the details of the, the actual restrictions, um, but just kind of is more of an overview. Is, is, or, or am I misunderstanding that? Is there, is there some um, restrictions that are actually being defined in O one O? Sorry, I'm having te technical difficulties with the ordinance. I'm trying to display it while we talk, and it, my screen froze on me. So, uh, but no, to answer your question, um, the and, and the. Um, point of, well, it's it's both, I guess, would be my lawyer's answer to your question in that 010 does not in and of itself create any legal obligations, but it does state what the purpose of the entire chapter is, 
And the purpose of stating the purpose is to guide anyone in interpreting the rest of the ordinance. So while 010 does not need to spell out or include every single nuance of the rest of the ordinance, if there were anything, if there were any way in which 010 does not match the mandates uh, in the rest of the ordinance, it would be appropriate to, to bring those into line so that the purpose and the actual requirements line up together. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sewell. I just wanted to second the motion for discussion purposes and ask that it be uh, put up on the screen so we could see what it would look like Mr. Jones, I can read back the motion if you need that information. That would be great. I've okay. got, I think I now have the ordinance up on the screen. Yeah, that's so that's that's the correct subsection. And then Mr. Fillmore's motion was to amend um, in the second line. So I believe that would be uh, 158 to 159 individuals living or living within or working, I guess living or working within or visiting Provo, Utah. And then the second part of the motion was um, to insert in line 162 um, after in attendance at large gatherings where social distancing is not possible, reasonable, or prudent. And I, Brian, I just sent that in the chat if you would like to, um, or you can just type it out. Mr. Harding. I apologize, I made my comment. All right, Mr. Sewell. Or did I just leave everyone's hand up and neglected to pull them down? <laughs> did you want to make a comment, Mr. Sewell? Okay, Mr. Hoban, go ahead. Uh, so I was going to second the motion. I, I don't see um, any concerns with it, really. If you know, if, if somebody would like that added, but I'm open to discussion. But I the motion was already seconded by Mr. Sewell. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Apologize. All right, any further discussion of the motion? All right, I'll call for a vote on the motion. We'll begin. Sorry, can I, can I ask a question? I was just reading it. Yes, go ahead. Um, so the, the phrase where social distancing is not possible, reasonable, or prudent, is that in reference only to the large gatherings or is that in reference to um, indoor and outdoor areas accessible to the public? Is that... What does that apply to? What's the scope yeah, and, of that in, in, in fact, now I'm struggling to, I think maybe this isn't in the right place because if it, if, because attendance at large gatherings does not uh, require uh, that social distancing not be possible. So I'm guessing that the intent was actually this. Is that correct, Mr. Fillmore? No, I actually intended it to apply to both. Uh, I can imagine an outdoor gathering, uh, Mr. Jones. Well, this, this is where, applying. This is applying to outdoors. My change made it so that it, your your edit doesn't apply to large gatherings because the ordinance does not have it, have that restriction applying to large gatherings. But under the terms of the ordinance as currently written, um, face coverings are required at large gatherings, whether or not social distancing is possible, reasonable, or prudent. But only indoors, not outdoors. Only indoors. Uh, That's my understanding. For for oh, okay at large gatherings, at large indoor gatherings. Well, 
I, I don't like the way you've structured it. Uh, my, my intent is to encourage uh, mask wearing in large social gatherings that are outdoors where uh, it's not feasible to do social distancing, whether it's an outdoor dance party or a, a public demonstration, uh, those are potentially highly contagious activities. And how, how does this not, how does this frustrate that intent? Well, you've, you've inserted the where social distancing is not possible after the reference to indoor uh, activities. No, it's, no, it's, no, it's after then, the reference to indoor and outdoor activities. Well, the first part of the sentence is both. Uh, you're right. You're right. I reread it and that works fine. Okay. So just to confirm, is any are any changes needed to what the original motion stated? If we could, um, I guess at this point, if, if we could just uh, reiterate, maybe Mr. Fillmore and the, and the second that what currently appears on the screen is what the is what the motion intends. Um, if Mr. Fillmore uh, affirms the changes, I'm happy to affirm the second. Yes. Mr. Harding. Um, there is a little more discussion that I would was hoping to have on what restrictions are we're, we're considering for various situations, individuals indoors, individuals outdoors, and then group gatherings indoors and outdoors. Um, if it's possible, um, I'd like to work those things out before updating the this kind of a summary and purpose because perhaps you know some decisions we make later might you know change what our summary should be i would suggest that we get a sense of the council on this mr harding right now we can always come back and amend it later before we approve the entire ordinance mrs ellsworth yeah, I'm just trying to get a little clarity on this purpose section. I'm not totally capturing what changes Mr. Fillmore made and what that does. Well, I'll repeat it. It would apply these uh, the general approach to people not only living or visiting Provo, but those who work here in our establishments. Secondly, it would clarify that uh, we have this similar concern about outdoor gatherings where social distancing is not possible. Large outdoor gatherings in particular. Okay. I agree with your concerns. It, yeah, if that's what's captured. Thank you. Mr. Sewell. Uh, sorry, I left my hand up. Okay. All right, any further discussion of the motion? All right, are we ready then to vote on that? Mr. Jones, is that okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Jones, if you need a break uh, so that you can work on some things, let us know. I was gonna say, I was just going to suggest once this motion is voted on, if you could give me a couple minutes to make the changes that I already made because when my screen froze and on base shut down, I lost the changes I'd already made. <laughs> so if I can, I can fix those ones really quickly and then go back to work in on the sunset uh, while you're while you're debating. But if I could, if I could make the ones about the uh, household and the signage really quickly before other ones are debated, that would help me keep track of what's going on. Okay, Mr. Fillmore, did you want to? Uh I was just going to say, uh, if we could have a vote on this particular motion now, I have one more to offer. Uh, we'll call, I'll call for a vote then. Mr. Hoban? Yes. Mr. Sewell? Yes. Mr. Shipley? Yes. I will vote yes. Mr. Harding? I'll abstain. 
Ms. Ellsworth? Yes. Mr. Fillmore? Yes. Okay, that's six in favor and one abstention by Mr. Cardin. Go ahead, Mr. Fillmore. Uh, by way of preface, I would just say that uh, members of the council are aware that I've been one of the, one of the most important issues to me uh, with this whole ordinance process has been to make sure we don't ever criminalize uh, the non-wearing of a mask. And we have, uh, we have resolved to make it a civil citation with the most of fine. Uh, the council members are also aware that I am uncomfortable with fining individuals who may violate the mask mandate. Uh, I would much rather focus on groups uh, I'm troubled by enforcement issues. Uh, I think it would be an undue burden on the police or, and not to mention our municipal courts. I really would rather focus on groups, but I, if, if my uh, head count is correct, I'm not going to succeed with a motion to that effect. But what I would like to make a motion on, at the very least, is that we insert a provision that before any citation can be issued, that the individual or the group would first be given a warning. Uh, and if they uh, did not uh, put on a mask or disband a group gathering, that uh, only then could they be issued a civil citation. I think it's only reasonable and fair. Some people may be you know, violating the ordinance in ignorance. Exactly. Yeah, I'm interested in everyone's feedback on what Mr. Fillmore just presented. My questions or concerns have to do with um, how we're going to regulate outdoor gatherings. So I think above in the purpose, we said that if you cannot reasonably social distance outdoors, then you must wear a mask. And then later down below, we're saying if there's more than 50 people, does that apply to indoor or outdoor? See large public gatherings, 50 individuals. Oh, that's just for indoor. So yeah, I'm just trying to understand what are all of our restrictions for outdoors at this moment in time. Mr. Sewell. Um, if, if before we tackle that, if we could come back to the motion, um, I had a question for Mr. Jones. So the notion of introducing sort of a sequence of fines or a, a sequence of steps in enforcement is, it, do we have a separation of powers issue with that, um, that approach? Well, I, yes and no. I, um, I would say, as I understand the proposal, it's in my experience, it's very uh, unusual to um, what's, okay, let me back up. It is not unusual for a legislative body to determine that consecutive offenses of, um, of, a violation of a, of, an, of a law receive greater penalties. So for example, the state legislature has set um, increasing penalties for DUIs and retail theft. Uh, penalties are, are, are set for first offenses and then for subsequent convictions, those penalties increase. Um, in my experience, it's very unusual, for, however, for a legislative body to set a maximum penalty and then legislate, make it the law for that penalty to not be imposed uh, because it is the executive body's uh, right and prerogative to enforce the laws as they are passed. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I wouldn't think it unusual if the amendment were to say a first offense, for a first offense, the maximum warning, the maximum penalty is a verbal warning. And there may be no fine imposed the first time that someone offends. Now, the, the logistical problem with that is the second, how do you know the second time you, in, you encounter a person who only received a verbal warning the first time 
that right. they actually have, have a prior offense if the only thing they reserved, received was a verbal warning. Right. Um, so, so I think that presents a logistical problem. And then just- Brian, Brian, yeah. excuse me, let me, before you go on, let me just clarify. I'm not talking about first, second, third, and fourth offenses. I, I know you're not, and that's my that was my point to Mr. Sewell is that if you okay. were, I would consider the the proposed amendment to not be unusual. But since you're not, I consider it. I do consider it to be unusual. Right, well, everything about this uh, this ordinance is unusual, I think, but in our circumstances with the pandemic is unusual. But what I meant to say, I just want to be clear to everybody. My request is that we amend the ordinance so that uh, individuals or groups are first given a warning. And if the individuals uh, comply and put on a mask, then great, no problem. Uh, but if well, they don't, it, then, then they could be cited. With respect to groups, it would be if they don't comply with the warning, then they could be given a citation for an unlawful group gathering right then and there. Well, and, and I understand that, but that goes exactly to the point of why I think it's so unusual, because if you are making it the law, that when first approached, a police officer, a code enforcement officer, and, and, a, and a, an official of the administrative branch must issue a verbal warning before um, then issuing the citation that is authorized by the statute. If that isn't followed, it's the administrative official that's breaking the law. No, no, I, let me, I need to add another concept. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear entirely. I think that the, whoever issues the warning, it's then because they're administrative personnel, police or otherwise, uh, then it's discretionary on their part whether they issue the citation. Well, I, I recognize that, but, but you're trying to say that it's not discretionary on their part whether they give the verbal warning, which then is, is posing, well, a, posing a requirement of law on them, not on the individuals. No, I, I would even make the wording discretionary under unique, you know, it depends on the circumstances. Well, uh, and, and that's exactly I, why. I'm just saying if, if, yeah. they're, if they're inclined to issue a citation, let me put it that way. If they're inclined to issue a citation, they, they owe that person or group a warning first. Is that better stated? I understand that that's your, your philosophical position on how this should be enforced. But again, I'm saying what, what, we're, what we're in the midst of doing right now is passing a law, not stating philosophical principles. And so I'm not opposed in any way to the council by motion stating, uh, making a statement to the administration that the council's preferred intent or preferred outcome is that people receive verbal warnings. But if you are going to make it the law that an officer who thinks that the violation is so egregious that they want to issue a citation may not do so without issuing a verbal warning, then you are passing a law that, that, that it is the administrative official themselves who would be in violation of it. Because, and, that, and that's why I just go back to the point of the, the normal course of business in this kind of issue is for the legislative body to set the maximum penalty and then to leave all enforcement, including discretion about whether something less than the maximum penalty is appropriate to the administrative officials that are in fact enforcing the law. Brian, I'm persuaded. <laughs> I will withdraw the motion. Mr. Mr. Harding. Uh, if, if the motion is withdrawn, then uh, I don't need to comment. Ms. Ellsworth? Same, I was just gonna relate it to speeding, but if it's not relevant anymore, then I'll withdraw my comment. Mr. Harding? Um, I am very interested in what I believe uh, Councilor Ellsworth was suggesting, which is trying to get some clarity on what situations, what, what is being required by the proposed ordinance under various situations. Um, so I have, I have some thoughts on that, but I don't know if, if now's the time uh, to share those. Uh, Ms. Ellsworth, go ahead. I would just say that I think we can leave the enforcement of this up to the administration. Um, 
And when I say I was going to relate it to speeding, uh, sometimes you speed and you don't know you're speeding. And sometimes the police officer might pull you over and give you a warning or they might give you a ticket. And uh, I think we should just leave that up to the administration and law enforcement. I agree. But I don't want to cut off debate on something that's currently being talked about, but I have one procedural question before any new topics are raised. Go ahead. Uh, I felt quite confident, well, in with, the, with regard to the changes to that have already been approved by motion to section 010, those were done on screen and have been approved. Uh, this, the change to 050 with the deletion of the current, of the previous subparagraph two was quite easy. Um, with regard to the change for um, individuals living in the same household, I made that change, but uh, uh, which was kind of directed in principle by a previous motion. I wanted to, before we discussed anything else, show you how I did that and and ascertain if that met everyone's approval before um, accepting that change uh, and, and removing the marking from it. So in O2O, what I've said is that face coverings are uh, are required when in indoor or outdoor areas access, accessible to the public, wear consistent social distancing of at least six feet from individuals not dwelling in the same household is not possible, reasonable, or prudent. Um, I, I thought about trying to put a whole separate subsection in the exemptions paragraph about it, but this seemed like an easier and, and more elegant solution. So I'd welcome any, if I guess, uh, I think that meets the intent of the motion. I'd invite uh, comments if anyone thinks otherwise. I would offer one comment, and that is, I would open it up to at least immediate family, uh, as, as opposed to those who dwell in the home. Uh, you know, you've, you've got family dinners and whatever else. I, I would think you wouldn't want to exclude brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers who live outside that particular house. Well, in, a, in, a, in the instance of a family dinner, um, if they're in their own home, then this isn't going to apply because it's not accessible to the public, but yes, you, but to Mr. Hoven's example about in the park, um, it would apply, but, but then I guess that calls into my mind a question of the science of, you know, if you have a son who has traveled here from New York and has not been quarantined, it, it, you know, if, if the face covering mask is really based on the risk of infection, um, do, do we say that, those people don't need to be socially distanced. But I, I just raised that as a question, not as taking a position on it. Similarly, you, you want to take a look at how broad do you make that exemption because you could end up with a party of 100 people at a, at a, at a wedding, all family members. Mr. Harding. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think there's there's value in defining it by household and not by uh, familiar relations. Um, I am concerned about some of those instances, you know, having a having a, a more extended family, you know, picnic at the park. But I I, I would like to explore, you know, when we get to uh, Ms. Ellsworth's uh, question about looking at these different situations. I, I, I think I would like to make outdoor um, our regulations or our restrictions on, on our requirements on outdoor um, you know, mass community requirements uh, more lenient. And I, I think there's a way to do that. And I think that might um, address the concern or at least part, partly the concern that, that uh, Mr. Fillmore is raising. Um, so I guess I, I would just, say that uh, I'm in favor of what is uh, proposed and is on the screen right now. And um, I want to make a, 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 a motion for a change later that I think uh, hopefully addresses some of the concern that Mr. Fillmore raised. All right, so I need guidance here on where we're at. We, we uh, did we? I get. I guess logistically, since um, I'm going to, I think the most efficient way to do this, it may not be um, uh, 
the most um, conducive to taking into account everyone's wishes, but I, I think the uh, most efficient way to handle this is to say that is I believe the previous motion was, um, uh, in my view, met by the language that's put here. And so I'd probably request that if, um, that if this, that another motion be made if this language, if someone considers this language not to be adequate so that specific other language could be debated. All right, so our, if I don't have any further comment from the council, I will assume that language is deemed adequate. Ms. Ellsworth? Yeah, just to clarify, this is for public spaces, right? Accessible to the public? Correct. Okay, so it doesn't apply necessarily to my home where I could have my, I could permit my neighbor to come into my home and- Correct. Okay, yeah. All right. So, uh, but we do we need to, I guess what it was confusing to me is whether we need to, did we have a motion to add that language or that language is okay now? The, well, that language was, that there was a previous motion that uh, directed me to Offer exempt that. individuals dwelling in the household. And so I think I've done that by, okay. um, by the language. So I think that a change is already approved. Um, and like I said, if, if what I've added is not considered by some to be broad enough or there are other exemptions that are also wanted, I'd, I'd invite another motion to that effect. Um, Just all right. to clarify, there there was a motion earlier that was approved 7-0 um, specifying that language. Okay, sorry, I just got a little little confused there. Mr. Harding, go ahead. Thank you. So I'm going to jump into it now. Um, right now, the proposed ordinance calls for masks in public indoor spaces when social distancing is not possible, prudent, or uh, reasonable, I think it is. Um, earlier, some, uh, Ms. Ellsworth talked about going into Target where they had a sign that said, you know, masks are required. Um, and I think it kind of alluded to, to maybe some local uh, requirements that made that so. Um, but then I also, I don't remember who it was, maybe it was Mr. Sewell was talking about um, patrons of the mall and if they're large stores, you know, that, that as long as they can socially distance um, masks, at least, you know, from the city's perspective, are, are not required. They may be required by businesses, but not by, by the city. So I wanted to, to see what the council understood this to mean in those uh, situations and if that's what our intent is. Um, with, with this, with what's proposed, um, is it our intent that people going into a place, say Target, uh, would need to have face masks? And, and is it our intent that people going into the mall and going into the, the mall generally, but the halls of the mall, as well as the, um, the, the stores in the mall, would we, is it our intent that this uh, ordinance would require face masks in those situations? Or is it our intent that, um, that people who go in there would have the choice to either stay, you know, uh, to socially distance or wear a mask. And, and uh, let me just say that, that I believe to achieve the outcomes that we're looking for, uh, I do feel like, um, you know, it, it's my understanding or it's my intent that masks would be required when going into grocery stores and to targets into the mall kind of thing. And I just want to make sure, um, to see where other people are at, if that's what they intend, and if that's, and if maybe if Mr. Jones feels like this language achieves that. Um, sorry, I'm trying to do three things at once and had and getting glitched out. Can you ask me one more time? I think. Well, go ahead, Mr. Harding. Sorry, I don't want to speak for you. Uh, you're free to restate it. That would make me clear if I, if I communicated well enough. Well, what I understood you were saying is you just wanted to get clarification from Mr. Jones that what the wording of the ordinance right now does make it clear that we are requiring masks inside of businesses at malls. 
um, and if that's the will of the council. Yeah, so, so malls, grocery stores, places like Target, do, do, does the proposed language require masks in those situations or does it require masks if people don't socially distance in those situations? So could someone go into a grocery store and not wear a mask and just say, well, hey, I'm gonna stay six feet away from people. Well, uh, maybe just speaking uh, from the, I'll let Brian answer the question specific to the ordinance, but I think um, all along I've assumed that that's what we were doing because the evidence indicates that that's a very um, easy way um, to transmit the disease, even, even if the social distancing isn't ideal, uh, or so, sorry, even if the social distancing is ideal, um, there, in, and sometimes I think it depends on the size of the, of the indoor space, but the, um, ability for the disease to be transmitted is still there. Um, so it seems to me that social distancing alone doesn't solve the problem. And moreover, I think it's very, very difficult to manage that. You can manage it when you stand in a line, but, you know, it's very difficult when people are moving in and out of um, the spaces in any store uh, to be uh, within six feet of everybody else. Uh, there's just not that kind of a buffer or shield um, th that would that would provide that kind of security. So I do think um, if we if we aren't guaranteeing that then uh, or, or aren't requiring that, then I think we aren't accomplishing what we would like. So Mr. Harding, to your, to your question, um, the ordinance currently reads, face coverings are required when a person is in an indoor or an outdoor area that is accessible to the public, if and only, I mean, this isn't the wording, but what it means is if and only if consistent social dis distancing is not possible, reasonable, or prudent. So if a person is in target and is able to prudent to, and is able to socially distance at least six feet from individuals that don't live in their same household, they are not required to wear a mask. I guess the question would be uh, whether or not, um, and, may, and maybe this is uh, fine, just left up, up to up to best judgment. But it does seem to me that one could argue that in lots of those places, it's not it's not likely. Like I say, you can you can, and a lot of stores do this. They put sign, you know, they put tape on the floor for the six feet spacing when you're standing in the line, but they don't control what you're doing in the aisles. Ms. Ellsworth? Yeah, I would agree. I feel like it's not enough in most places to say, um, at least indoors, that if you can social distance, you don't need to wear a mask. I don't feel like that's, I don't feel like that's realistic or reasonable. Feedback from the rest of the council, Mr. Harding? I don't know about the rest of the council, but uh, I just wanted to point out that um, today there was some discussion in, about the advantages of modeling um, the, the city restrictions to be similar to BYU's restrictions, just so it's one you know, fewer set of rules to try to remember for the, for the students. And um, the closest analogy to what the, the BYU uh, requirements are would be um, masks are required in all indoor public spaces. Um, and so I believe that is not what is currently written in the proposed ordinance, but um, if we were to go that direction, then um, I think that I think that it has that, uh, that uh, synergy, I guess, with, with the BYU restrictions. So are you making a motion, Mr. Harding, or? Mr. Hoban? Thank you. I, <laughs> I actually, um, one of the redeeming values, I think, of the ordinance amongst, you know, many others, but some of the issues I've taken with it, I think one of the things that is redeeming about it is it does offer some choice so 
if a restaurant can find a way to ensure that people can safely social distance, they have that choice. So I would, I guess, say we keep it, if I'm not mistaken, keep it as is where it's, you know, where it states whenever it's not prudent, possible or, or whatever, um, as opposed to just outright, you know, mandating anything indoors. Ms. Ellsworth? I like the idea of being consistent with BYU, making it uh, streamlined and straightforward and simple and comparable to what people would expect on campus. So they don't feel like they have to manage two different standards. Mr. F Mr. Harding. One, one other disadvantage of leaving it as it is now would be, you know, what does the signage say? The signage says that you know, um, by city law, uh, masks are required here unless you, uh, unless you generally stay six feet away from other people in the in the establishment. It just it, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, and the, like the face coverings, the, sorry, the O2O, the language that's on the screen here, is where consistent social distancing of at least six feet. And I guess I kind of assumed that meant like, you know, if you're passing by someone, um, you know, that that's inconsistent. You know, meaning meaning um, or am I reading that backwards? Okay, so maybe, maybe I'm reading that backwards. But anyway, but but just if 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 we're saying that it's masks or consistent social distancing of six feet, it makes the, the signs a lot more complicated. And um, I think it's the, the expectations. I think are a little bit more more difficult to communicate. Mr. Fillmore. You're muted. My opinion is that we ought to leave that language the way it is. Uh, BYU is, is an entirely different context. They have some possibilities and uh, enforcement issues that we don't have. Uh, I think as long as we have signage in the stores, students won't be confused. They'll know what the expectation is. And I think we need to give businesses some latitude. Uh, some businesses can do social distancing. It's no big deal. Uh, others simply can't. And I think we need to show some good faith with our local businesses and uh, encourage them to do the right thing. Yeah, sorry, I keep talking here. Um, but I, I will say that I believe the state mandate, it could be mistaken, um, does enable restaurants to you know not require face masks in inside um as long as they can space tables out such appropriately um <laughs> i think i think if if we're going to go down this path we've got to start carving out exceptions i i would lean towards signs having to be more complicated than restricting that um lean towards i would strongly encourage you know i, I would i would take complicated signs over that in any, any day. Um, I think it's gonna lead to a lot of issues or challenges. Uh, just for clarification, Mr. Jones, we don't require masks in, in restaurants. We have a, an exe exemption for that, correct? Uh, there's an exemption for those individuals that are seated at a table and eating. Mm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cool. Or sorry, Mr. Hoban, did you want to make? Uh, I think I think I still lean uh, lean towards. I keep saying that I still am very supportive of keeping it as is, just giving some flexibility. Um, I uh, yeah, that's that's a lot to ask, in my opinion. Mr. Sewell, I would like to very much to keep uh, Councillor Hoban's hard-earned support on this, and I think he represents a sizable group of citizens that have, uh, you know, concerns about this for, for various reason. And given that we've put this out there this way, uh, I, I don't think we should add restrictions at this point, but, but I, 
I'm sympathetic to the concerns and maybe this would be something we could review at that, you know, that, that first review point, if we feel like it's uh, creating a loophole that is making it substantially less effective, then we, we could address it at that time. Ms. Ellsworth. I was just going to say that if we do compare this to BYU standards and they do require everyone indoors to wear masks, BYU is doing a lot to accommodate students that are uh, distanced, right? So in their classrooms, they're blocking off whole rows and they're marking where you can sit and where you can't sit. So in most circumstances, students are consistently socially distancing, but they're still required to wear masks. And that's still my preference is that we just be consistent and accept for our exceptions. People need to wear masks indoors. Um, it might be that they didn't intend to come within six feet of someone, but that in the course of checking out or, or uh, interacting with a cashier, they are within six feet of someone. So I think it's just the, the expectation we should have is that a mask should be worn indoors. I think that's straightforward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure if we have a motion before us or not. If so, I'd like to, if not, I'd like to make one. Uh, that was my question. Do we have a motion? Was Mr. Harding making that motion? Or... Uh, I, I, was, I was not making that motion. Um, I, I wanted to discuss it and, and I, I feel comfortable with the language as is. The motion I would make is that we leave the language in this particular section as is. All right, do I have a second on that? I would just say, I don't think we need a motion to keep it as is. I think as long as there's not a motion that changes it, then it stays as is. Yeah, I don't sense there's support, but I do think um, we ought to be clear that what we're doing um, by I mean, I, th there's a question of effectiveness and there's a question of clarity and um, so on that I think is, are, are important considerations here. But as far as like the general health guidelines, if you're gonna be indoors for long periods of time or sustained periods of time, even if you're social distancing, it's safer to wear a mask. So that would be my preference. But if there's not a will on the council to make that a requirement, then, then there isn't the, the will. But I think we ought to be clear at least that that is actually um, what is recommended. Mr. Harding and then Mr. Strachan, sorry. Okay, so so I think, uh, I feel like we've resolved that, that first one, the individuals indoors. Um, I'd like to propose or I'd like to discuss um, maybe relaxing the restriction that we're considering for individuals outdoors. Um, and I, I hope this isn't too um, contrived of, a, of an example, but if I go running with my neighbor along the Provo River Trail and, and we're running side by side, um, I believe the, the, the language that we're considering right now would require that uh, we both run with masks. And I'd, I'd say that um, the, the, the scientific data that we've been looking at would suggest that such an activity is, is quite low risk. And so um, I am interested in um, you know, reducing, because right now uh, our requirements uh, for masks for, for individuals, both indoors and outdoors are the same. And, and I definitely feel like outdoors is much lower risk. And I think that our, our ordinance should um, should recognize that. And um, so just for, for an example, what, what I'd be interested in doing is basically not having any sort of um, mask requirements for individuals outdoors, unless they're in groups, of, say over 25. And so basically, if, as long as you don't have a mass gathering, there's no mask restrictions when outdoors. But if you're over 25, then there is a mask requirement if you're not socially distanced. Uh, Mr. Harding, just for clarification, uh, the, the ordinance as it stands, as highlighted here, does, um, I know you're not just talking about strenuous activity, but presumably any hiking, running, biking, uh, tennis, other, other recreational activities would not be um, included here. But um, anyway, I just wanted to make sure you were clear on that. 
Mr. Fillmore. If, if that is a motion by Mr. Hanley, I will second it. I think uh, that 25 number makes good sense to me. And in addition, I think we need, we, we certainly don't want to disincentivize outdoor activities. Well, that's, that's a healthy element here in our efforts against the virus. So I will second his motion. That was just for clarification, it was Mr. Harding's motion and Mr. Fillmore seconds. Um, Mr. Oh, oh, just as a point of order, um, Mr. Strachan noted in the chat that there is already um, an exemption for exercising. Um, I don't know if that is, applies only indoors, but um, it might be good to clarify that before. And then if Mr. Harding could restate the motion, that would be helpful. Does that only apply indoors or I thought I assumed it was both. Well, go back. There's one of the exemptions it was individuals engaged in strenuous physical activity where circumstances are not reasonably conducive to wearing a face covering, such as swimming, running, fitness classes, etc. Yeah. Yeah. That was the exemption that you just talked about a minute, a moment ago, Mr. Uh, Chair Hanley. And it does yeah, apply both indoors and outdoors. Right. But I believe Mr. Harding is going a bit beyond that. Yes. I, I agreed. Yes. Yeah. I think we're all on the same page. We're just reiterating that there is an exemption for that specific running example. Well, I, maybe okay. you guys haven't seen me out running, but it's more of a slow jog. So I don't know if it qualifies as a strenuous, but, you, but yes. Are you, uh, are you breathing hard? <laughs> <laughs> well, if anyone can call the mayor, then that would be strenuous. We'll call that strenuous. Absolutely. But, but yes, I, I, what, I, what I'm proposing, I was proposing it for discussion, but I'll, I'll make the motion. Uh, just to streamline our, our discussion of it, but I, I move that we um, adjust the language of the proposed ordinance so that there are no mask mandates um, for individuals um, outdoors in public spaces um, unless the gathering is over 25 individuals and uh, where and the phrase about uh, social distancing isn't prudent, reasonable, or whatever the third one is. Prudent. Prudent, reasonable, or prudent. Okay, is there a second on that motion? I, th I thought uh, Mr. Yeah, okay. Yes. Any further discussion on that motion? I'd, yeah. I'd like to, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Sewell, and then Ms. Ellsworth. Okay. Um, I'd like to see it in writing. I'm, I'm having a little trouble following it. And then uh, the other question I had was about the number, you know, the 25. I wondered how, how Mr. Harding came to that number or how he would feel about a, maybe a little smaller number or something like 10 maybe. I don't, I don't know what the right number would be, but. Um, I'm, I'm definitely open for discussion on that number. I, in my head, it kind of had that uh, extended family picnic uh, in mind. Um, that's that's where I came up with the, the, the 25, but I'm, I'm, I'm open for the discussion, but I do think I'd prefer 25 over 10, uh, just, just, I think, kind of for that reason. You know, Mr. Sewell, this may be one of those issues we could uh, fine tune in, in October. Ms. Ellsworth? Yeah, I would prefer 10 as well. I feel like if we say it's 25 and that kind of opens things up to a party, which I hope we can avoid in general. Um, not that I don't like to party, but I just think 10 is a greater, a greater, affords us more safety. I'm okay with 25. I mean, I my concern was more with the indoor stuff anyway. Um, and I am concerned that uh, this will get, um, I, I just want, want to provide, I want to encourage people to go outside and I want to encourage maximum flexibility. So I'm okay with that. So further discussion. All right, I'll call for a vote on the motion and we'll uh, go to- Mr. Uh, Hanley, Mr. Hanley, I think, um, I'm not sure if others felt the same. Mr. Sewell had, I think, expressed a desire to see exactly what the motion would look like in practice. I apologize. Before a vote, I'm trying to make that happen here, if you'll give me just a moment. So, Mr. Jones, if I could make a recommendation as you're trying to do that, um, 
if we just struck outdoor in 020, and then if we added another provision in 030, where we're talking about large public gatherings, so if it's indoors, then it's over 50, and if it's outdoors, it's over 25, if, if that's the number that we ended on. That, that might be a, a way to structure it. So we need to give Mr. Jones a moment here. Is that? Um... Yeah. So, and then just, yeah, replicate uh, subsection one under um, 030. Uh, but make it instead of applying to indoors, make it apply to outdoors for 25 individuals and then give the, the social distancing exemption. Mr. Sewell. Um, I'm wondering if that might conflict a little bit with, well, actually what I would prefer is why, why don't we just give Mr. Jones a few minutes and then come back to this when it's, when it's all, all there. Is, is my screen currently, can you see my screen currently? Yes. I just want to call attention quickly to Mr. Strachan's comments in the chat where he says, let's not carve out every possible situation. Um, I think we can be, we can uh, be a little bit broad and leave discretion of enforcement and in action to the administration. Let me make sure I understood the, uh, the motion correctly is, um, is it regardless of, is it for the outdoor situations where there's more than 25 people, is that regardless of whether social distancing is possible or not? For outdoors, it's only, um, it, it's not regardless of social distancing, it's only um, if social distancing can't be observed. Yes, that's the motion I seconded. So uh, with regard to Ms. Ellsworth's concern, I, I actually agree in principle, but I think that in this case, the last thing I want is for people to be calling uh, to report individuals uh, seen outside. So I do think if this protects from that possibility, uh, it's worth it. Okay. So I think, um, I think I've now done what Mr. Harding suggested. Um, so in O2O, O2O no longer applies to outdoor areas. And now under large public gatherings, large public gatherings indoors of more than 50 individuals requires face covering regardless of whether um, social distancing is possible or not. And outdoor public gatherings of more than 25 individuals requires a face covering if social distancing is not possible or prudent. That, that is what I uh, moved to. Uh, uh, let, let me change. clarify that the the public the large public gathering organizer uh, requirements in what is now subsection three was it your intent that those apply to both organizers of indoor public gatherings and outdoor public gatherings? Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jones, let me ask you in uh, subparagraph two: Do we still need that phrase, not dwelling in the same household? Not necessarily. I had the, I had the same Let's question. Take that. As well I, think, I think the number 25 covers it pretty much. Uh, Mr. Sewell. A uh, couple questions. Um, I still think we need that not in the same household in there. Uh, I guess that's a comment. And then I'm sorry, I'm just having trouble following this here. So if, if you're outdoors, and there's less than 25 people. So there's no requirement for a mask. Is there any requirement for social distancing? No. Okay. David, David, my thought is if there certainly got to be a rare household that's over 25. And if they are over 25, they probably ought to be social distancing. Well, um, so I'm just thinking that means you can have 
groups of five, 10, 15, 20 people uh, basically doing anything outside. I mean, there's no, no requirements at all. Well, short, short of uh, breaking uh, criminal statutes. Right, right. I, I just think 25 is the right number for now. And if the data tells us we need to tighten that, we can look at it in October. All right, any further discussion of the motion? All right, I'll call for a vote on that motion. And we'll begin with uh, Mr. I don't remember where I, uh, Mr. Hoban, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Shipley. Yes. Mr. Handley, I will vote yes. Uh, Mr. Harding. Yes. Ms. Ellsworth. Yes. Ms. Fillmore. Yes. And that voting is unanimous. All right. Are there other suggested amendments? Any further discussion? Mr. Sewell. Okay, so I'd like to come back to Mr. Hoban's comment uh, in quite a while back where he was suggesting that if we just had another day or two and uh, right, rightfully uh, wishing for or hoping for uh, some way to um, close ranks with the administration, that's something I've hoped for. We had a brief uh, discussion about that before I handed it off to council leadership. It seemed like we were far apart, but I don't really know what's happened since then and any discussions. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess if there was a real possibility of that happening in one or two days, then I think that would be well worth it. But I just don't know if that's if that's a reasonable expectation or, uh, that, that that could happen. So I don't, I don't, know, where, I don't know where we'd go with that. Um, Mr. Hoban, did you have something specifically that you wanted to propose in that area or? Well, thanks, Mr. Stuhl. I, I was kind of referring to the, your, what you just referenced um, where we were, you were, uh, basically that there was a possibility there to get uh, to find some way to find some common ground to get the administration to support something um, and, and hopefully that would then make whatever we whatever we adopt more effective um, i do think that i don't want to speak for the administration so where we currently are at with the ordinance i i can't speak for them and and i would not feel comfortable saying you know Hey, I think they would support this or not. Um, and I know that I don't know if we necessarily want to put them on the, put the mayor or, in, or on the spot right now to ask him or comment. Um, I definitely would be supportive of trying to, to find a way to make that happen. So I guess I'd just ask for comment from council leadership at this point, because I think you've had the, probably the closest communications. Uh, Mr. Fillmore, did you want to make a comment first? I did, I did. I, I want to say that uh, I, I applaud uh, Mayor Kafusi and her staff. I, I think they've done a remarkable job with respect to education and encouraging people to do the right thing without making it compulsory. I just think that uh, in, in our current situation, uh, where our numbers are not going down, they've either plateaued or they're moving up, where we have 60,000 students returning to the area, uh, and where we're about to enter flu season, I just think it's the potential for a perfect storm. And we have to do more than just education. And so we've, as a council, my gosh, how many hours have we spent on this? studying the scientific reports, the medical advice, governmental recommendations. And I think the, the, the vast consensus is that masks help. Uh, even if we feel that maybe they don't help me that much, 
in terms of preventing me from getting the virus, it does help other people. And I think it's important for us to, to do it for others. Uh, call it an act of charity to, to protect other people from what we may be spreading, uh, particularly where people are asymptomatic and they don't know that they're, they're carrying it, but they're still carriers. I think we need to do it for the benefit, the sake of our fellow citizens as an act of, of charity and concern, and also to allay the fears of those who are generally worried and fearful about going out in public these days. And it's, it's such a minor inconvenience. Uh, we don't have to, it's not, everybody doesn't have to wear it. It doesn't have to be worn everywhere. It doesn't have to be worn all the time. We've tailored this to very limited circumstances in public spaces where there's a higher uh, potential for infection. And I, I thank my fellow council members for being so thoughtful and so careful in trying to fine tune this so it's not overbroad. And, and we're, we're gonna defer to the administration on uh, their discretionary enforcement, uh, that we don't have an, a, a real outbreak in our schools where we have to take a hard look at more serious uh, requirements. Uh, and this, this is the, the least we can do. If we're gonna err in any sense, let's err on the side of safety for our citizens. I'm Mr. Tool. So um, I guess without putting anyone on the spot, I, I just want to uh, not necessarily ask, but certainly invite if the administration would like to say something. Uh, I would love to hear it. If you just soon be quiet, that's fine too. But you know, you've sat through this long meeting and uh, it's certainly interested in your thoughts. So I don't really think two days is even going to be enough time to get us closer together. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. I, I want to just echo uh, Mr. Fillmore's comments and uh, certainly um, uh, want, wanted it, in the past several days, uh, I've, I've been not feeling inclined to want to try to pressure or put you on the spot because I wanted to respect your, your difference of opinion on this. And I think that's probably uh, fine where it stands. I think as a council, uh, we do hope that we would have some cooperation on this and that, that uh, the, the will of the council will, will um, be significant enough to, to help, help motivate uh, action on this sooner than later, given the, uh, urgency of the situation and the very hard work that everybody's done in order to uh, get us to this point in, in, in the time that we have. Um, we respect, uh, respect the difference of opinion, as, as, uh, as I said, and we're grateful that we've been able to, to conduct this as, as well as we have under the circumstances. I don't think any of us have uh, relished uh, the opportunity to be on different sides on this. Um, obviously, our community is divided on this. Um, and, and I, as I said in my comments earlier, I think this is a situation that calls for us um, to model and, and call for others to, to engage in, in the kind of respect and kindness that we need to uh, maintain during this difficult time. And we know that we, we get that from you and we hope that you know that you get that from us. Um, any, any further comment from the council? We have an implied motion on this, Mr. Strachan, go ahead. Based on comments I've seen online and, and based on um, the, all the changes that have been made, I would recommend we ask Brian to just give us a review of uh, clause by clause of what we've changed and, and show it up on the screen before you vote on the final ordinance. All right. Um, while Mr. Jones is preparing that, actually, I do want to make one, one clarification about a comment I made earlier. Um, I, I, as a District 2 representative, uh, I, I also am in regular communication with BYU administration. And I hope that nothing I said implied that BYU was um, either privately or publicly or in any other way offering their opinion about a mask mandate or mask ordinance in Provo. 
Uh, all I meant to communicate in what I was saying earlier is that official positions of neutrality uh, don't necessarily obligate us to believe that uh, the neutral party is, is either opposed or, for that matter, in favor. Um, I was arguing for the fact that a lot of neutral parties who have respected, like BYU has, um, um, uh, without exception, I've never seen anybody in BYU leadership trying to bend arms behind the scenes. So I just wanted to make that very clear that I wasn't insinuating that there had been any kind of communication along those lines. Um, but I do think when, when parties like BYU or the governor's office um, uh, officially take a neutral stance, um, I do think it's um, that doesn't mean that, that they're opposed or it doesn't mean that they wouldn't welcome it. And I was um, suggesting that given the way in which the various policies of all these different institutions have lined up, I think it's pretty clear how all of those institutions, the school district, BYU, UVU, um, uh, and IHC and others, how they feel about masks and the importance of wearing masks. That's all I, that's all I meant to say earlier. Um, so I see Mr. Harding's hand up. I don't know if Mr. Jones needs more time to pull something up. So maybe Mr. Mr. Harding, go ahead. Um, I, I had, uh, I just had, was curious if we needed to update the purpose. Um, but I believe, uh, that will be addressed in the review that's upcoming. Yeah. And I'm, I'm ready. So let me, um, let me put it up on the screen and, uh, let me do two things before I um, actually review the ordinance step by step. Um, as Mr. Harding had suggested, I think that now that we've made some changes to what the ordinance actually does, the purpose needs to be amended to bring, to bring it into line with that. So my proposal would be to, and I, I, if this strikes anyone's fancy, I would invite a motion to this effect, but I would propose editing section 010 as shown on the screen to specify that face coverings are required in three circumstances. In indoor areas accessible, accessible to the public where social distancing is not possible, reasonable, or prudent. In attendance at large outdoor ga gatherings where social distancing is not possible, reasonable, or prudent. Or in attendance, actually let's change that to an and. Uh, and um, in attendance at large indoor gatherings. Now, again, this doesn't uh, impose those requirements. It's the other sections that do that, but this I think would bring this into line with the other changes that you've made. Mr. Harding? I move that we adopt the language on the screen into the implied motion. Mr. Sewell? Second. Any discussion? Okay. Uh, I will call for a vote on the motion. Uh, begin with Mr. Shipley. Yes. I will vote yes. Mr. Harding. Yes. Ms. Ellsworth. Yes. Mr. Fillmore. Yes. Mr. Hoban. Yes. Mr. Sewell. Yes. Okay. That voting unanimous. Okay, um, then I wanted, again, before, as a second thing before going back over it, I wanted to um, go back to the issue of a sunset clause. Um, struggled with this a lot, and, and there may very well be a better idea than this, but I've been, I've been trying to do this at the same time while following all of the other conversations that have been going on subsequently and um, decided at the end of the day that I think Mr. Strachan's suggestion is probably actually the best and that the easiest way to do, the, the simplest way to do this in the short term is to simply um, put a expiration date that is at least 15 days after the decision date so that, um, and well, and you'd really need more than 15 because um, if there was a veto, you would need to... Um, then of the renewal, you would then need to take the time to call a special meeting. So my proposal to satisfy the previous motion would be to say that if the council doesn't amend by ordinance the expiration, the ex expiration section of the chapter, 
then the chapter automatically expires on November 15th. That gives you a 25 day cushion. So 15 days for um, processing uh, and, and time to call a special meeting. And then my proposal, I, I recognizing the desire in that original motion to, to do a subsequent review every two months. Um, I just haven't had time to, to kind of craft a readable way to do that. So my suggestion at the moment would be that at the October 20th meeting, we do a motion to amend this section to change it to, to the, the dates two months later. Um, I think that's the easiest, but I, I welcome feedback on whether that uh, meets the intent of the motion. I can't remember if I was the one that made that motion, but I'm comfortable with what was just uh, just uh, suggested, and um, if necessary, uh, I think I think that's I support what was just recommended. Mr. Hoban. Mr. Harding, don't try to steal my motion, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with it, yes. Okay. So do we need to do a separate motion or we just, uh, as long as the wording is okay, we're good? As long as nobody objects to this wording, this will be the, the wording that is now in the, the version to which the apply, implied motion applies. And by voting on the, the, ex, the implied motion and its exhibit, which is this, it will be approved in that way, ratified by that action. Ms. Elgin. So, oh. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Mr. Jones, did you want to say something else? Oh, I was going to go back and start doing my step-by-step -step review of what the ordinance says, but if Ms. Ellsworth has comments uh, before that, I welcome those. No, do your review and then I'll make a comment. Okay. So, uh, let me let me save this real quick <laughs> so we don't have that problem again. Okay. So following all of the motions, the, here is the current version of the ordinance to which the implied motion uh, by council rule would apply. Um, we have uh, the preamble, which uh, wasn't amended, but states uh, all of the uh, whereas clauses from the previous resolution about why um, this ordinance is, is being considered. We have the amendments to chapter 9.17 of Provo City Code, which makes violation of the uh, later described chapter 9.25 a civil infraction. We have the edit that shows that as such, violations of that chapter uh, are subject to a fine as defined in this table. And, oh, here we go. And that uh, violations of Section 030 sub 3, which imposes special uh, rules on uh, the organizers of large gatherings, uh, are subject potentially to a fine of up to $500. And uh, that all other violations of Chapter 9.25 and 9.17 are subject to a maximum fine of $55. Uh, then we have Chapter 9.25 itself which has a purpose section, which we just looked at, uh, which states the purposes for which the chapter exists. We have a section 020, which requires a face covering when in an indoor area accessible to the public where consistent social distancing of at least six feet from individuals not dwelling in the same household is not possible, reasonable, or prudent. Uh, in other words, if you are indoors uh, with in a publicly accessible place and you are not social distancing, uh, or cannot social distance, a mask is required. Um, we uh, then have the large public gathering section, which requires um, uh, we sorry, I got distracted by a question in the chat. Let me come back to this. So we have the large public gathering section, which says any, any individual that's in an indoor public gathering of more than 50 individuals should be required to wear a face covering, regardless of whether or not social distancing is possible. An individual that's in an outdoor public gathering of more than 25 individuals must uh, wear a face covering, but only if social distancing is not possible. And anyone who organizes a public gathering 
that violates subsection one or two and promotes that event without requiring attendees to wear face coverings or providing public notice at the entrance uh, of that requirement is, viola is in violation. And this is the provision that is, and the only provision that is subject to the $500 um, uh, fee, which I think, um, which I think clarifies the question that was in the chat. So I'm gonna consider that answered, Elizabeth, that I think that uh, 9.17 is accurate as it's written, that it should only refer to this subsection, uh, if I understood your question correctly. And then we have a list of exemptions. We went over these at the beginning of the, of the meeting. Brian, but, sorry, yeah. my question was more um, just in that table in 9.17. Um, so it says, where it says all other regulations listed in subsection two of this section, I just wondered if we should just list the whole reference 9.25.03 sub two, or is that referring to section? Th this, is actually, this is actually referring to section 9.17060. Okay. Oh, so okay. I, I that understand. clarifies my question. Yeah, Thanks. so it, this is actually the section that, it's, that or we're referring to. And because violations of 9.25 are listed in that section, then therefore all other violations of 9.25 plus all violations of 9.17 are subject to an, a $55 fee unless okay. they're listed elsewhere up here. Thank you for um, clarifying. I thought that might come up when we yeah, submit this to co-publishing. Yeah, that's a great question. It was, uh, it's kind of a confusing scheme, but the cross-referencing is, is uh, important to what we were trying to do with the civil infractions. Um, there's a list of exemptions. We didn't actually change any of those. Um, but uh, during this meeting, uh, but uh, individuals under five years of age with a medical condition, uh, hearing impaired communication, safety regulations, uh, facial services, restaurants, uh, identification during transactions, and strenuous physical activity are all exempted. Uh, then there's a requirement that businesses uh, post uh, these requirements at the entrance and a reminder that organizers of um, let's see this is going to need a this is going to need a requirement. Uh, I think I think that that is probably sufficient because this subsection isn't a isn't a, doesn't actually impose the requirement. It's really just a reminder so that if someone is only looking at the posting section, they know that they also need to go look at, at this subsection up here about the, um, about the requirements for large public gatherings. Um, and actually, let me, let me come back to that and make sure that this is clear. So it's, under the terms as currently written, it is un, it's illegal to organize a, an indoor public gathering of 50 people or an outdoor public gathering of more than 25 people where social distancing isn't possible and not require the attendees to wear face coverings. It's also unlawful to organize an indoor gathering of more than 50 individuals and not provide notice at the entrance. That particular provision does not apply to outdoor public gatherings, which off the top of my head seems to make sense since there is not an, an entrance. Um, but I wanted to clarify that that was the case. Um, so actually now that I say that, uh, I'm going to reject these changes because they are not necessary because there is no requirement for posting for the outdoor ones. There's only a, requ a requirement that they enforce. Um, and then penalties are a civil infraction and the, exp and the expiration is mid-November, if not renewed by October 20th, as already indicated. And what I didn't do before is I need to delete this section. Um, okay. All right. So given all of, given everything I just did and the fact that I actually made some changes um, as I went through, I would recommend at this point that if this, if what I went through meets everyone's satisfaction, that someone make a motion 
that the exhibit currently on the screen now be the exhibit to which the implied motion applies. I so move. I'll second. All right, we have a second. Do we have a discussion? All right. Uh, I know their hands up, but I just wanted to quickly take care of that. So we'll uh, start with Mr. Shipley. Yes. I will vote yes. Mr. Harding. Yes. Ellsworth. Yes. Mr. Fillmore. Mr. Fillmore, I think you might be muted. Yes. Mr. Hoban. Yes. Mr. Sewell. Yes. The vote was unanimous. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Ellsworth. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of clarify and summarize this ordinance, right? If someone came to me and said, what did the Provo City Council approve last night? I would say outdoors, we don't require masks unless there's more than 25 people and you can't social distance. And indoors, masks are not required unless you can't social distance. Am I capturing that? And then I'd, I'd say there's one more aspect to that, and that's indoor gatherings of more than 50 have to have masks regardless of social distancing. Okay, so indoor, if there's 50 plus, you have to have a mask. Outdoor, if there's 25 plus, you have to have a mask if you can't social distance. I thought indoor was 25. No, indoor is 50, outdoor is 25. The way you stated it was correct. Okay, so <laughs> I'm just hoping that it would be straightforward for citizens, but indoor, if there's 25, no, if there's 50 people or more, regardless of social distancing, you have to wear a mask. So basically Macy's on a Saturday. Now outdoors, if there's 25 people and you can't social distance at a family barbecue per se, you have to wear a mask. Is that correct? All of that is correct, except that I would, uh, based on our previous conversation, I would probably take issue with your um, example about Macy's, as 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 I have understood the discussion as we've as we've drafted this. I don't consider um, shoppers coming to Macy's as a public gathering, even if there's more than fifty of them. So, I my I think as far as Macy's goes. Uh, O2O would apply, and as long as social distancing was possible, reasonable, or prudent, you would not have to wear a mask in Macy's regardless of the number of people in the store. Okay, so I can go into Macy's without a mask as long as I stay six feet away from everybody and their service animals. That's the way I would interpret what has currently been, been drafted. But on the other hand, if you um, attend uh, uh, you know, a, a, a church meeting or a, 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 or you have a party or um, you have some other kind of gathering where, where people are coming for the purpose of an, of an individual event uh, and there's more than 50 people, then masks would be required even if social distancing were possible at the event. Okay. To me, it doesn't feel like enough that someone can go to Macy's on a Saturday and not wear a mask. Um, but I'll... I'll leave that up to my fellow council members if they want to adjust anything. I would. I'm, the only thing I would comment on that is I think that goes to the the heart of uh, Chair Handley's previous comment about it's easy for me to say from a legal perspective uh, of of just trying to interpret the words of the ordinance that it is hypothetically feasible for someone to go to Macy's without wearing a mask, but I think I think Chair Handley's point otherwise is that it, or, or earlier was that in his mind it would not be possible to social distance in such a situation. And so therefore a mask would be required. Um, but, but the social distancing, the existence of the social distancing or not is, is the key from a legal perspective. Yeah, I'm just afraid that we haven't captured enough, like this isn't broad enough um, that someone could argue and feasibly go to Macy's on a Saturday and, and not wear a mask. Mr. Harding. Uh, just let me gonna see everybody we're at nine nine p.m. So I was just gonna say that, that that was the intent of my discussion earlier, asking um, if we intended um, indoor public spaces to require masks or if, if we wanted 
to, to allow that choice between masks or social distancing. Um, if I remember that the council was, was somewhat divided on that, but there was, it didn't appear that there was sufficient support for uh, requiring masks. Um, so I think that's where that was decided. I think I would agree with that. I think uh, Ms. Ellsworth and I were the ones who expressed the reservations about it. And I would, I would suggest at this point that we consider that as some, something that we review um, uh, as we move forward. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that it, at least with the ordinance in place and the signage up that um, uh, compliance just kind of settles in. I think that's actually been the experience of other cities uh, that, that uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a period of uh, uncertainty and a little bit of clarification, some clarification that's going to be needed. And, and uh, we'll have to work together and hopefully with the administration on that to be able to make everything clear to the public. But I think um, in time, the, the behavioral changes will happen. I just want to point out, too, that um, in the, in the follow up report that Dr. Sloan sent to us, she talked about a tipping point and the tipping point really depends on two factors simultaneously. And that is the frequency of social interactions and the, the compliance with the health guidelines. And um, I'm hopeful that this will improve that, uh, uh, minimize that risk of that tipping point happening sooner uh, rather than later. And that hopefully it's avoided um, in the way that um, uh, she, uh, she and of course all of us hope. Um, any further comment from the council before we vote on the implied motion, Mr. Hoban? Uh, I could have addressed this later. I just wanted to apologize. I, it was brought to my attention that I was out of decorum. I had cut off Mr. Hanley uh, a handful of times, and I apologize for that. I really no excuse, and um, just sorry about that. <laughs> uh, no, no problem. I'll just call you Travis. It's all, it's all love here. Don't worry. Um, but I appreciate that. Um, okay. Any, any other comments from the council? Um, um, Mayor Kafusi is requesting um, uh, to make a comment after we vote. So let's, uh, let's do the vote. Um, we'll begin uh, with, I, I'll begin with myself. I'll vote yes. Mr. Harding. Yes. Ellsworth. Yes. Fillmore. Yes. Hoban. How did this happen? I don't know, but yes. Mr. Sewell. Yes. Mr. Shipley. Yes. All right. The voting is unanimous, so it passes by uh, a unanimous vote. And uh, Mayor Kafusi, please. I think you're still muted. Sorry, I might have clicked it by mistake. I think we both clicked at the same time. <laughs> All right, thank you for allowing me to say a few words at the end of this meeting. And thank you for the concern you have for the welfare of Pro Bonus residents. I believe you and I are united in, des in desiring to make Provo the best and safest place it can be. We're also united in our desire to see the highest possible rate of compliance with COVID-19 guidelines provided by the state. In other words, you and I have the same destination in sight. Where we part is on how we get there, which path to take. Tonight, you have chosen the new path of a mandate, a law in the books that requires citizens to wear masks or face penalties imposed by the government. I favor staying on the path that we have been on until now, a path that I think has been highly effective in implementing a sea change in behavior throughout our city in a relatively short period of time. Our path so far has emphasized self-regulation and has tried to send a signal to residents that they are trusted and equal partners in this effort. We have implemented a, var a variety of positive educational campaigns to encourage mask wearing. You have helped with those and the citizens have responded. Through our collective efforts, yours, mine, and the citizens, Provo has remained in the yellow zone, meaning the level of state restrictions for Provo is low. I believe that the path towards our destination of greater unity, harmony, and compliance for our city is the path we're already on. 
Let's enhance our campaign. Let's redouble our efforts. Let's engage incoming students and help more and more Provo residents choose to wear a mask. I believe that in our path forward, while a law requiring masks would be a step in the wrong direction. For all those reasons and for other reasons I have shared previously, I respectfully announce my intent to exercise my authority to veto this law. While I'm sure the veto is not welcome, I do hope you welcome my early announcement of it so that you know where I stand. Thank you, and I look forward to working with you to get closer and closer to our shared destination. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Any, any comments from the council before we close? Well, Mr. Ms. Ellsworth and Ms. Uh, sorry, Ms. Ellsworth and Mr. Sewell. Yeah, I'm curious what the staff would advise next. What alternatives do we have after a veto? Um, the statutory process, the mayor has, well, the first, the first thing that has to happen, uh, since all, as I understand, I think all that's happened right now is the mayor has announced her veto, her intent. Uh, and hasn't taken formal action yet and, and can't because the ordinance has not yet been presented to her for her signature. So uh, for those who are interested in the logistics, the next step is for council staff to process tonight's action in the on-base system as they would normally do. After the council, after um, the steps in the work, in the on-base workflow have been finished and the ordinance has been presented to the council chair for electronic signature, it will then be presented to the mayor for electronic signature. At the mo at the time, uh, once it, on the day that it is presented to her for electronic signature, she has 15 days to sign it, not sign it or veto it. If at the end of 15 days, it, it, it will become effective either uh, if she signs it or if 15, 15 days have passed without her either signing it or vetoing it. If at some point during that 15 day period, she vetoes it, um, she is required by state statute to deliver to the council a written statement of her veto and of the reasons for it, at which point the council is mandated by state law to reconsider the ordinance at its next uh, meeting, which doesn't have to be a regularly scheduled meeting, it could be a special meeting. Uh, so uh, as far as uh, uh, logistics for the council itself to consider, um, it, it would be for the council to think about when to have that next meeting um, uh, to respond. At such meeting, if the ordinance were passed by five, were, were approved by five or more council members, uh, it would then take effect. Mr. Sewell. Um, I have several comments. Uh, first of all, Mr. Hoban, it sounds like you've got your two days at least. <laughs> because uh, this, this will delay things. Um, and uh, to Mayor Kafusi, I just want to express my appreciation uh, to her. Um, you know, in, in the past on the council, uh, from time to time, I've, I've heard councillors uh, kind of get upset about the you know, possibility of veto, but I've never looked at it that way because I just view it as the mayor is an integral part of this process. And it's a way that by state statute that she can participate. And uh, um, so I don't really look at it any differently as a difference of opinion among counselors, um, you know, being expressed in the way we vote and so on. So I do appreciate the early um, announcement. And I just wanted to make a couple of general comments. Um, I really think uh, I feel like the scientific evidence uh, is strong that uh, what we're doing will make a difference. And I think the resistance um, from our citizens uh, is, is largely a cultural and, uh, and a political um, issue to some extent. And I just wanted to offer a comparison. Just thought about this today, actually. I was thinking about the country where I served for two years in Japan. And uh, I just was curious because I know 
that mask wearing is considered a very polite thing to do there. It's very common and there's little resistance to it. Um, and I also know that the Japanese are very uh, willing to do what the government asked them to, uh, to show respect for the health of others. So naturally, uh, they've been very quick to, to adopt things like this. So I was curious, uh, looking at the, I looked up the death rates there today, um, and a lot of Asian countries have a similar culture. So I looked at the death rates in Japan, South Korea, China, Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, and just, just looking at Japan as an example, they have 10 times our population density. Uh, and yet their death rate per capita is over 50 times lower than ours in this country. And I'm sure there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think a definite strong part of that is the culture of wearing masks as a, as a sign of respect for the health of others. And if we had in this country had been able to achieve the same death rate that they have achieved in Japan, instead of 175,000 deaths, American lives lost at this point, we would be looking at about 3,100 American lives lost. So anyway, I think this is important what we're doing. All right, I thought I saw another hand up, maybe not. Um, I will just ask the mayor, um, you know, I, I, I certainly respect the process here. I am obviously very disappointed um, and I'm worried uh, because uh, with a 7-0 vote, I think we've sent this very strong message that we feel very strongly about this. So there's a very likely chance, of course, that we would, we would still push this through and what this is gonna do is it's gonna cause a delay in the effectiveness of this ordinance precisely at the moment when it's most needed, precisely at the moment when we have the best opportunity and the most important and pressing opportunity to avoid the tipping point. So I just, I just wanna know, I, I just, you know, I need, I need to express that. I feel it strongly that this is, a, this is uh, a risk that we're taking as a community as a result of a, of a political battle. And I, I regret it, even though I understand it. Oh, Council Chair, um, I disagree with you. I acted quickly tonight for that sole reason, and we will act quickly tomorrow. All right, uh, well, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad for that, certainly. All right, any, any other discussion? Or if not, um, if there is no objection, we will adjourn the Provo Municipal Council meeting by unanimous consent. Thank you all and have a good night.